I'm thinking. We're good? Okay, I'm thinking we're gonna start every, every in-studio live stream with me looking to the left. I see my face on this little iPad uh, to make sure that we're live. Sorry for the delay, but it's gonna be well worth the wait. Um, another Locals in-studio live interview with Paolo, and I've been spending the better part of a day making sure that I pronounce his last name properly, Figadero. No, Figueredo. Yeah, that was I, pretty good. Oh, and I, was, I knew I, I was pronouncing it. The do comes at the end, Figueredo, which means fig orchard, if my research has um, proven to be accurate. Yes, it's the fig tree. It's amazing. The, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be... Uh, it's going to be more than all things Brazil, but this is going to answer uh, a lot of the questions that people such as myself had, you know, like what the heck is going on in Brazil? Is it true what we hear now about compelled vaccination, failing which you lose state benefits? What's the difference between Bolsonaro and Lula? The history of corruption in Brazil, which from what I now know is rich, thorough and um, well-developed, so to speak. So. We're going to do this live on Rumble, live on Locals. At the end, we'll, we'll end the stream on Rumble like we typically do. Go to Locals, see if we can get some uh, specific questions for the Locals community. So if you're watching now, you can go check it out, vivabarnslaw.locals.com. Paolo has an interesting uh, history, is an interesting person, and is going to enlighten us today. Paolo, thank you, and um, welcome. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me. I've been a, a fan for a, for a long time now. This is, I, I've done my homework on you over the last couple of days now. Okay. So I've watched uh, some of your interviews. I've done some history research on Brazil, which one podcast I mentioned said it's, it's amazing. The history of Brazil is, is very unfamiliar to most North Americans, North Americaners. So before we even get into there, 30,000 foot overview, who are you? Uh, and then we're going to get into not just your childhood, but the childhood of your forefathers, because they have an interesting childhood and adulthood. But who are you? Thirty thousand foot overview. Well, I'm I'm a Brazilian journalist. Uh, I'm I used to be, and I'm still. I am an entrepreneur uh, from Brazil as well. And uh, for some reason, people um, like me on the internet, and that that made me a a known journalist in Brazil. Um, before I was fired a couple of weeks ago, um, I was hosting the number one show in the country, number one political show in the country i was nominated by by the public the number one show and uh, and that's pretty much it okay I'm, gonna, a, I'm also a father christian okay, uh, i'm gonna unpack all of that because that's it that those are things in and of themselves we're going to need to explore but the history of your name you have um a unique is an understatement if i'm not mistaken your grandfather was a president of brazil he was my my grandfather was a president uh, from uh, 1979 to 1985. He was uh, the president that uh, gave the power back to the civilians. So he was the one that instituted a full democracy in Brazil. Not that Brazil had a complete dictatorship before, but it was not a full democracy. And uh, he he uh, when he was the president, um, he was the last military president. And he also gave amnesty to all political prisoners. Uh, he governed with a, a direct elected Congress, uh, governors elected by the people as well, a free press, no censorship. I believe uh, during his term, Brazil was, uh, was, had more liberty than it has right now. Okay, I mean, that's phenomenal. There's not very many people who get to say my immediate family, grandfather was the president of Brazil. For actually, even going further back, the history of Brazil, uh, and then we'll get into how long your family's been there for um, and your personal life. Um, Brazil, some people may not know, it was founded after Napoleon defeated or was about to defeat the Portuguese. The Portuguese say, We're abandoning Portugal, They're flat. and we're going to go to North America and run Portugal to South America. To South America, sorry, go to South America to run Portugal from. South America, Brazil. From Rio, from the city I'm from. Uh, and it, it, it was great because it was a, a period of uh, great development in, in Rio. And Rio became the capital of the Portuguese Empire, which was a big thing. Por Portugal was a very, uh, although it was, was also a small country, was a very uh, important, a very powerful country with a navy that was one of the most powerful navies in the world. Uh, but not not strong enough apparently to fight Napoleon, so that's why. And, and Napoleon said, "Oh, these were the only guys that fooled me." So uh, that tells a lot about uh, 
<laughs> about our, our culture, I, I guess, in a sense, in Brazil. So yeah, and 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 after that, um, Brazil. Uh, right now, Brazil is one of the most important countries in the world. Most people don't realize that, but Brazil not only has a huge population, fifth biggest in the world, if I'm fifth not. biggest in the world, uh, over two hundred million people. Uh, Brazil is also a very rich in everything that you need from a geopolitical, strategical perspective. So we have a lot of energy from different sources. We have oil, we have hydroelectrical energy, wind, uh, solar, everything, every every kind of energy that you can imagine. Brazil has a lot of it. Uh, it used to be auto-sufficient, uh, self-sufficient in oil. Now, not, not as much. Same as in the U.S., the leftists. They take over, they stop the, but close. And uh, also the food. Brazil is one of the f largest uh, food uh, producers in the world. So, uh, one of the largest meat producers in the world, grains and all that. If uh, Brazil, if Brazil stops exporting chicken to China, China will starve in three months. So uh, Brazil also has a lot of minerals, a lot of, uh, Great coast, huge coast, lots of rivers. So it's 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 a very important country right now, and it happens to be a society that's culturally very close to the American. It's Western societies in general, but very Brazil is very similar in a lot of senses uh, to the American society. So uh, capitalism, well, if you can call it capitalism, what we have these days, uh, it's 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 very it's very present in Brazil. People, Brazil and social media, one of the largest uh, social media users in the world. So it's, it's, I have, I have to say, I'm surprised on how little people know about Brazil being Brazil is so important. It, well, the geopolitical importance is something also that I've only recently become sensitive to because of the issues and because of China's dependence on and therefore interest in Brazil as as a country. And when you speak of the uh, historical similarities or, you know, cultural similarities between Brazil and America, some people may not know that Brazil was actively involved in the in the slave trade back in the day. And at one point, I think the, I, I heard two mixed numbers, but a substantial portion of the population were slaves, which led to slave uprisings. It's a multicultural uh, society. Um, I, I'm, look, I, I knew that Brazil is big on meat and it's also big on mixed martial arts because back in the day when I was into the UFC, Anderson Silva was, you know, my go-to favorite fighter. We invented the UFC. Time. UFC was invented by the Gracie family. Oh my God. Well, I'm an idiot now. They're going yeah. back to Royce Gracie in the yeah. early days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They invented, uh, actually we have uh, one of the guys that was part of uh, the, the Gracie, uh, uh, Royce's uh, crew. Uh, is here in Miami, uh, Pedro Valente. He's actually my master in in, in, in uh, jiu-jitsu, my jiu-jitsu master. Uh, well, great guy. We, we were talking about this before we went live. Yes. I, I've been saying, I'm going to learn mixed martial arts. I you, used to you, do you have to. wrestling as a kid, and I did judo as oh, a younger so, kid. Oh, so you're going to do I have, awesome. I have good muscle memory. So you're going to do awesome. Okay, um, that's the history. The, the brief history of Brazil, if anybody's interested, go download a podcast and get a more thorough history of Brazil. It's It's fascinating. Oh yeah, and and Brazil became a republic and very much inspired by the U.S. republic. I mean, the political system is is presidential, at, at least in paper. The constitution is somewhat inspired in the American institu uh, constitution, like most constitutions in the Western world. But it's, it's a presidential system. Congress works in a very similar way. So if you understand Brazil, if you understand U.S. politics, you have a rough understanding of uh, Brazilian politics as well. It's, so it's with, with, very, the super, with the Supreme Court with heavy influence that's not quite as evenly divided. that Canadians understand better than Americans. <laughs> we're we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, family history. So how long has your family line been in Brazil? Have you been able to trace it? back? Yes, I traced it back. And it's amazing because uh, uh, and, and that was mind blown, mind blowing because I only found out about this a couple of years ago. But most of my my most of my uh, family they they were in the military some way. So the first two Figueiredo that arrived in in, in Brazil, they were towards what year? Uh, it was in the, on the 17th century. So they that's arrived. 
correct. You've been there for hundreds of years. Yes. That's so I'm like incredible. the Mayflower of Brazil. Okay. Uh, uh, and and they arrived to be uh, Captain General, which was um, it was like the highest rank you had in the military back then. So both of them in the mines of Minas Gerais States, diamond mines. Uh, and it, it was very interesting because after them, you would trace all all my forefathers, and and you would say you would see that a lot of them were military. So my you, you know that my grandfather, who was the president, was also a four star general. This is how he became the president. Before him, his father was also a general, which uh, that started a revolution in São Paulo, a big one. He lost, but it was uh, one of the high one, one of the largest, if not the largest. Uh, rebellions, revolutions of Brazil had more than over a thousand people died in São Paulo, uh, fighting against uh, the dictator that we had back then, Getúlio Vargas. His father was also in the military. He he, uh, he founded uh, the logistics in the army. So if, if, if you go back and back and back, you see a lot of generals, uh, people in the military, some politicians and some journalists as well. So I was fascinated. <laughs> I was like. How? No, it, it is. Um, how much you control? How how much free will you really have, right? No, but but the ability also to trace family back that long. It's not not everybody can. Recent immigrants to to North America, like I, we can trace my grandparents back, and maybe one generation before that. But then it gets it gets uh, it gets disappeared. But um, these apps now, they have amazing apps these days, like, well, because the Mormons are like tracing everyone back. It's, it's, it's because amazing. because you can baptize if you were a Mormon, uh, you can baptize people after they die, so they trace and and also there's a lineage thing, so they trace everyone back, just like the Jews. That's very cool. No, that's amazing. Well, we we've we tried with one side, we got back to a, a Lvov, I think, you know, early early 1900s, but before then it becomes very very difficult. But maybe we'll give it another another go. Um, but you, your your grandfather becomes president. How does he die? Like, when, when does he die? How old are you when he dies? How much do you know of this? And do you have a, a unique life as a descendant of a former president? Does that change the way you live in Brazil? Yeah, he died in, I believe it was either 1999 or 2000. So it was either 17 or 18 years old when he died. And um, yeah, when I, when, I, when, I, when I was born during his term. So, yes, it was different. We had to have uh, secure detail and all that. I grew up a little bit like that. Also, a lot of people around us because he was he was not only the president, but he was also a figure that everyone gravitated around him. Uh, but but I, I had a very down to earth. Uh, I was raised in this way. Uh, my parents were very down to earth. Um, my grandfather was known to be very humble, very very simple person, and uh, and so it was unique in a sense, but. I mean, I'm a very normal guy. And uh, your parents or your father or your mother had no political aspirations to continue the Figueiredo dynasty in, in Brazilian politics? So it's, it's, it's interesting because um, during my grandfather's term and political career, because before uh, being the president, he was the chief of the intelligence service in Brazil. And before before that, he was the chief of the military cabinet as, as well. So there's, there's a career. You just don't become president. And my father, he always advised my family to stay away from him. It was all, my father was a businessman, uh, and he he lost several opportunities, business opportunities. Because my grandfather said, "No, no, 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 that that might look bad." So very different from Hunter Biden, uh, but it was the mentality. No, you got to do what's right. You need to, to, people need to have confidence in the government. So if any, if, if it's anything that people might have questions about it, stay away from it. So also politics, like don't get involved with it. It's like my thing, you, you being the, and he also didn't want me to join the military. To, so it's, it was, it was, it was like that. And what, what did your parents do uh, for a living, or what do they do? My my father is a businessman, and uh, my my mother is uh, also a businesswoman. So, so um, do I know? I don't know when you left Brazil to come to America. I left in 2015. Okay, so, so we're, uh, we're going to come back to that because that's we're going to skip over a big period of time. Uh, so you grow up in Brazil. You leave in 2015. Uh, what do I? I think we're about the same age. You're, how old are you? I'm 39. Okay, I'm, I'm older than you. Um, 39. 
So 2015, you're, you're, you're an adult. What do you do for your childhood growing up um, in Brazil? And, and hold on, I had another question. I forgot it. Uh, what did you study? And, uh, and then what led to you leaving Brazil? So uh, gr growing up in Brazil in the 80s and 90s was amazing. The country was safe. Uh, lots of opportunities in the 90s start becoming not as safe. But it was, it was great. Rio is one of the most amazing cities in the world. It's beautiful. I grew up in a very uh, back then rural part of Rio. It was very not urbanized. Um, I live in a beautiful big house, lovely parents, like everything that you can, you can uh, wish for. Great. Uh, the school that I went to was like kind of like a paramilitary school, uh, but it was in a farm. So it was beautiful. I grew up with uh, farm animals, cows, pigs, chickens, and all that. So it, it was great. Very was kind of far from the urban Rio de Janeiro. And then when I when I went to high school, I went to more the urban Rio, and it was great. I had fun. It's, Rio is a fun city. I decided to then I decided to my my grandfather was uh, still alive, I decided to become a journalist. And he didn't like that at all. I remember that. Because of the risk or because of the nature? Because he hated journalists okay. already. Understandable. So <laughs> your, your, your granddad is president when the semblance of, uh, of avoiding corruption was important and when journalists were still detested, I guess. <laughs> so so yes. never changed. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and, uh, but, but to be fair, Journalists back then, during his time, was already biased, and he suffered a lot from 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 it. But now it's something different. I mean, there's there's bias, and there's a activism. I mean, it's, yeah, it's biased. It became and it's gone into it activism. became a propaganda machine. Yeah. The, it's it's different. It's like you can be biased, and I think everyone has some sort of bias. You just you, uh, not being biased can be a goal, but it's impossible to achieve it perfectly. And but now it's something different. Now journalism became uh, propaganda. It's it's something different. I mean the mainstream media at least. And um, so I decided to go to journalism school in the Catholic University of Rio, and he hated it. And but I, I was a rebel. I decided to do it anyways. Uh, but it, but during journalism journalism school, I I noticed that that was not what I was expecting, in the sense that it was already very leftist. And was I was never uh, socialist, leftist. I was more towards the center at one point. This is like early two thousands. Early two thousands. Yes, yeah, so I'm talking right. about. I I was sixteen when I entered college, so it was like uh, nineteen ninety nine, two thousand, I believe. Okay. So when it was when I decided that I wanted to become a journalist, it was still alive. Um, and 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 then I I I, I switched to economics. So that was like, oh, and then I'm like, yes, this is what I was expecting because I, I like numbers as well. So um, and then I started to work. So I always liked politics. So I started working when I was 16 as an intern in my mother's company, like just arranging magazines and in the marketing department. It's, like, it's just like an intern. It's, when you're 16, what, what do you know? Uh, and. Of course, it was getting better and, and being promoted. But uh, when I when I went to economics school, I told to, I turned to my father and said, "Look, I really like politics. I want to work with a politician." And he introduced me to a friend of him, uh, which was a congressman. His name was Eduardo Paes, and and that guy was the anti Lula guy that we had. And I'm talking probably now two thousand four or five. Anti Lula in demeanor or ideologically like conservative to the to the. We didn't side. have any. This is a thing about Brazil. We didn't have a right until I don't know 2014. We had didn't left have a right until 2014. So Brazil. It's, not, it's interesting. I mean, it's some people often say like once a country goes left or socialist or whatever, it never comes back. But if you're dealing now with Brazil. Which, I mean, was it always left or was it a centrist left at that point in time that went further to the left that then gave rise to something on the right? So I think the, we had a right until my grandfather's government. And then when he, um, when, when the civil uh, society took, took over government, no, no, the military stepped out, um, I think there was a sense of like a revenge or something like that. So we're, we're going to do just left it's beautiful 
to be left. Okay, we're getting rid of these military guys, and we're gonna uh, all uh, signal our virtue of being a leftist. Okay, and then Brazil. So if you think about it, and Brazil also had a president, a, a guy called Collor, which was was more towards the right. I'm talking about 19, early 1990s. This guy that more liberal, economical, economic liberal reforms, uh, like more free trade and stuff like that. Brazil was a very close economy. And, uh, but after him, everyone that came after him was a socialist in some way. I mean, we had uh, Fernando Henrique, which was the president for eight years in Brazil, was the guy that came before Lula. His party was the Social Democratic Party of Brazil, uh, which now is very close to Lula. And uh, uh, but during a large, large time, it was the worker Lula's party, which was the Workers' Party, against the Social Democratic Party. So we had either communism or social democracy. There were the two options that we had, and uh, the, that changed with Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro was the first guy that changed that. And, and, and before him, of course, when a politician, um, when, when you have a politician, it means the society changed in order to elect that politician. So Brazil started changing in the 2010 or something like that, a, a, a philosopher. I know you studied, you studied philosophy as well. So Brazil had a philosopher called Olavo de Carvalho, who was a teacher, had thousands of students, including myself, and he started to explain a little bit about politics and what was, uh, he was not a conservative, but he explained what was a conservative, what, what, what being a conservative meant. And, and, and so before him, uh, I, I mean, Brazil had no right. But Eduardo Paes, I was, I was talking about yeah. Eduardo Paes. Eduardo Paes was the right that we had. So he was in the Social Democratic Party, so mean, means he was opposition to Lula. So that, that's what we had. He was the right that you had before Bolsonaro. Yeah, okay. he was not right. He was right compared to Lula. He was anti-Lula. So it's it's uh, it's the Overton Winden. So if if you're focusing on the left and you all all you see is the left, okay, you have a small window, so you don't have the perspective of the whole thing. So you see the left fighting am, among themselves. So the guy that's least on the left is your right. It's what you consider right. So Eduardo Paes was that. Now he's a big supporter of Lula. But I worked with him for, for a few years. I went to the state government. I was his, like, his advisor. Um, and, and it was fun. And then I left the government because uh, it, was, it was definitely not for me. Okay. Um, was it, uh, I guess the, the history of corruption is something we're going to have to like flesh out as we go through this. But... You, you have a stint where you get involved in politics uh, to the guy who was the right at the time but has since now become the supporter of Lula on the He's left. the mayor of Rio now. Okay. At Re City of God was in Rio, right? City of God was in okay. Rio, yeah. Um, that was my, my childhood exposure to, to, to Brazil, to Rio. To, was it watching that movie? And I was like, okay, well. Have you watched Elite Squad? No. What is it called? Elite Squad. Elite uh, yeah, squad. it's Tropa de Elite in Portuguese. Elite is, Squad. Is it good? It's, oh, it's amazing. Okay. Is it a movie or a series? No, it's a movie. Well, it's a movie it, with Maddie, Wagner. If you're listening, Elite Squad, that'll be our next. Is it is it appropriate for kids or no? No. <laughs> okay, good. Not so at all. <laughs> we have a we have a date night movie coming. It's the least appropriate movie for violence the, and sex. Yes. Okay. Well, good. So that's I, I don't mind that in movies. Okay. Um okay, so that, I mean that all to say that's my exposure of, of what I understood Brazil to be. I in, in my lifetime I've never I fear the world. Just preface it with that. But I've never known of a Brazil or a Rio that was not you know, said to be high crime, high risk. Uh, it's interesting hearing your 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 upbringing and, and now, you know, where Brazil has gone today. You have your stint with politics. You say definitely not for me, but I just got to ask why. Like like, the, the, we, garbage wheel turning for the sake of wheel turning, or corrupt, insidious, uh, fake relationships, or another reason. I, I'll tell you with a well. So for example, it was very sad for me to see Eduardo Paes, who was an anti-Lula guy, run for mayor of Rio. And to, and this was an anti-Lula guy when I started working with him. 2005, let's say. And in 2008, he runs for the mayor of Rio with support of Lula. It was like, 
yeah, there's something wrong with that. You can't, you can't do a 180 in three years. There's something wrong with that. But also, while I was working in the state government, one of the largest projects I was in charge as a special advisor to the, to the Secretary of Sports was the privatization of the Maracanã Stadium, which is a soccer stadium that we have in Brazil, which is legendary. Pelé played there. It's like it's old and legendary. It was built in the 50s. Huge. Almost 100,000 uh, people capacity. So I was dealing, I was the head of the project that would privatize Maracanã Stadium. So one day, I, I, was, I was working like crazy. So it's not easy. As you know, you have the economical aspect of it. You have the legal aspect of it. You have public, public hearings about it. You have, so it's like, after you got all the clearances, Brazil won the candidacy to host the World Cup uh, of 2014. And then uh, Lula announced, Lula was the president back then, he announced a line of credit to every state of one billion reais, okay? What's the exchange rate? Of right now it's one to five. Back then it was one to two. One to two meaning two? Half, like Lula authorized back then half a, mil, half a billion dollars okay. as a line of credit to the, to, the, to the states. So one day, Eduardo, the secretary, calls me on his office and said, you know, the Maracanã project is, we're going to have to halt it. I was like, what? Are you out of your mind? It's like, I've been working for, for a year. I've been busting my ass to, to make this happen. What are you talking about? And he's like, did you read the papers? I was like, what? He's like, Lula authorized a, a line of credit of half a billion reais. I was like, I don't care. We're privatizing it. So the private sector will take it. And this, this costs the, 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 this costs the states $50 million a year in losses. So we're going to send it to the private sectors. They're going to do, it's like, they're going to turn into a beautiful state. We won't have to do, deal with it. Our state's not going to need this line of credit. And he was like, you're really innocent, right? I was like, why? It's like, do you think our governor is not going to do the construction for a project that's half a billion dollars? It's like, what? It's like, yeah. And he didn't say it, but you know how you know how much in bribery this guy's gonna get? He's not he's not gonna let it go. So now, and and by the way, the 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 the, the stating was not privatized, and you know how much we had uh, on our ass mates, the whole to adapt and and to modernize the stadium in a, in order to be able to host a World Cup, we would spend uh, by by the numbers back then, roughly I don't know eighty million dollars, and and the private sector would take care of it. You know how much he ended up costing? I'll say the line of credits was I, half I was a billion. Gonna, I was going to say the, the entire line of credits N uh, more, six hundred million dollars. And it's like they, they used the whole line of credit, they spent it all, and said, oh, we need more money. It, so how, like, ca how can I work in an environment like this? This is like Parkinson's law of mundanity, except on the political <laughs> corruption scale. Like the, the, the project will expand to fit the budget that you have exactly. for the project. Um, okay, well, that's an experience that's enough to let someone know. That's just it's a tiny. Corru it's corruption all the way. It's not turtles all the way down. It's corruption all the way down. But By the way, it, it, this guy, Eduardo Paisamir of Rio, I've never seen him being, and I was very close to him at one point. And he was, his name popped up in some corruption lists. But while working with him, I've never seen any indicative of corruption by him. But the system in general? It was unbelievable. Well, that, so that's the question. I mean, all of politics is corrupt uh, and has been throughout the history of time. But there are levels. There right? are levels. Now, um, we're now learning about the, the, you know, the levels of corruption in America. Well, I'm learning about it now in Canada. Um, some interesting news coming out of Canada. We've seen what happened and is continuing to happen in the States. It, it, uh, understatement of the year, it's the next level of corruption in Brazil. When did it get there, or was it was it always there to some varying degree, but took off at a given point in time under a given politician? So I was watching the interview that you had with Glenn Greenwald, and he described in a, in a fair way that Brazil always had a corrupt a corrupted system in a sense. 
Okay. What he didn't tell you, and, and I think is it's important to know, is that when the Workers' Party took over... This is Lula's party. Lula's party. And took well, over, this is in 2000... 2003. Okay. Okay. Uh, everything reached a different level. Everything. And the goal for the corruption was also different. So we always had politicians that took a percentage uh, to become rich. That was always part of the system in Brazil. The Workers' Party, they came up with a different system. Their corruption was not as much oriented in terms of personal uh, enrichment, but to maintain the power. So one of the, the, the big scandals, the first big scandal that they had was in 2000, it was right after they took office. Uh, they took over in 20, 2003. So they found out that it was, it, was, it was very clever, if you think about it. They, they are like, okay, we're in a presidential system and we need to pass bills. Like, same as in the US, like, let's say Joe Biden, okay? Uh, and, okay, and um, we have 500 members in Congress and they have a lot of requests and they all they all want to make money but how much money these guys want to make it's like i don't know if you pay them in today's currencies let's just say back then if, if you pay them like ten thousand dollars a month they will vote with you forever like at least half of them it's like really yeah wow what is the size of my budget oh you have like a trillion dollars budget really yeah so just give them the money and let's pass all the bills we can. So that was the men's salon scandal. I'm, I'm, it's a, it was a real thing. It went all the way right. to Supreme Court. So the way what they did is that they, the, like the public bank, the state-owned bank, uh, government-owned bank, federal government-owned bank, Banco do Brasil, the Brazilian bank, they, they had an advertising uh, contract uh, with a advertising agency the guy from the advertising agency just like a hundred million dollars let's say the guy from the advertising agency was just withdrawing money on the bank and going in congress and distributing a bag of money to half of congressmen this is like this is before the internet really took off i guess because th this type of stuff i mean you couldn't it, it wouldn't be so easy to hide today you'd have to like you know cloak it under uh lobbying or, or something you know like reimbursement of expenses just outright no, uh, they just, payoffs. well, you have an advertising agency guy, he goes to the bank, he withdraws money, and he gives, <laughs> it's like, it was, a, it was a real thing, for several months, for every month, okay? So, that was Lula's party. For some crazy reason, he, he's, he was never convicted because of this. They said, well... A anybody convicted or no? Yeah, several ministers. What's the, the name of the project, just so people can Google this themselves? It's called Mensalon. How do you spell that? It's... M E N S A A L A O Mensalau, okay. Mensalau, which means a monthly given, it's like an allowance, okay. Mensalau, it was it was like a big allowance. Yep. That was that was it, and it was a big thing. It was a huge scandal. Uh, the Social Democratic Party, which was opposition to Lula, said, you know what? After that, he's doomed. Let's not push for an impeachment because politically he's doomed. If we impeach him, uh, the vice president might take over and might be a challenge uh, on the next ele election. So let's not impeach him. Let's wait because he's a bad man walking. And that was in, I don't know, 2005, six. So Lula was a very, as, as, a, as a smart person said, okay, so you're going to leave me alone. Okay, so he started the largest uh, distribution, money distribution program in the history of the country. This is the, the, when it became a welfare Yeah, state. a welfare it's program. Yeah, it's Brazil. So it's like it was a food stamp program. Brazil didn't have a food stamp program. What's the name of that? Because that name I remember thinking is very similar to Bolsonaro, but it has nothing to do with it. It's Bolsa. Bolsa means purse. Okay. Uh, and also means some, some sort of allowance or support. Familia, which is okay. family. Bosa, it's B O. It was B O L S A. -S -A. So Bolsa Familia, nothing yeah. to do with Bolsonaro. Zero. And it just means a family allowance, and that is, uh, I don't know. It's we, a food stamp program. Okay, not not not. Uh, okay, not not universal basic income type thing, but it's 
Yeah. No, because it was not universal. It was. It, it it it's actually a good program from an economics perspective. Okay. okay. Um, so it was a ba if you were if you were very poor, Brazil didn't have that, although he had a very poor population. So Brazil, if it didn't have any money, if you were really poor, you would get a food stamp uh, program uh, to to buy basic stuff. From a cynical political perspective, however, Lula right now is buying off. Of course, a massive portion of the population. Of course, forever. Vote him back into power. Yes. So, and then he got real. And, and and in the meantime, also, so Brazil is a big commodity exporter. So, Brazil was exporting commodities like crazy in the early 2000s to China. China was in need of everything, and Brazil was. That's when China became uh, Brazil's uh, largest economic partner. Mm -hmm. So, so Brazil, Brazil's economy, and also the demographic uh, pyramid. Brazil was having a lot of people joining the workforce, so it was great for the country as well. The the level of productivity, productivity in the country, internet was becoming a big thing. in Brazil, a lot of reforms that the previous government had done started to kick in. So Brazil started to take off economically. So because of that. Um, um, so Lula, Lula became very popular. He had an economy that was doing very well, uh, a social program, a new social program that was fantastic from a political perspective. And he got reelected by a broad margin. It was, it was almost close, but he got reelected. You know, and he, be, he became popular as ever. Remember, people knew, most people knew that he, he was involved in a scandal, a little in a, corruption scandal. He, they, he doesn't have control over his, his minions, and they took some money, and they got punished, and it won't happen again. Yes. The thing is, it sounds like Trudeau level, Justin Trudeau level corruption, except it sounds like Lula might have actually done something good for Brazil, whereas I can't think of one good thing that Trudeau has done for Canada. He's had, one, you know, he's had his scandal after scandal. Everyone knows about it, and yet gets you know, reelected with a minority government. But Lula, at least it sounds like back in the day, might have done something good if only for cynical purposes, despite his corruption. So he gets a good, a good social welfare program in place. And he did a lot of bad things as well, because um, the, 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 side of, the size of the state in Brazil increased like tremendously. Size of the? Of the government. Of okay. the, uh, so uh, uh, he hired, so the government deficit, he hired a lot of um, public servants that's like another, crazy. That's another good demographic that will always vote for the government. Exactly. You pay, you, social welfare and administrative state and you yes. have captured two thirds of the population. Exactly. And and he hired like nuts. Uh, well, and and the, the amount of laws they passed that were harmful to the country. We all, you only pay the price in a few years, right? You don't pay the price immediately. Like when you pass a good bill, a good reform, you, you, don't, you don't get the dividends immediately. Uh, same thing goes with a, with a bad legislation. But the problem is that Brazilian people knew, I think most Brazilians knew that Lula was corrupt, and he did, they didn't care. But that was the Mensalão scandal, mm -hmm. okay? But as you can see, it's different from personal enrichment. Is the, is the money is not to buy a boat, it's to keep power. It's to corrupt the institutions, not to corrupt people, but to corrupt the institutions. So remember, if the executive branch is by now the leg leg legislative branch, it means you you don't have a republic anymore. You have a, in fact, you have a dictatorship. And because with the legislators you just pur you just purchased, you can also use them to confirm, let's say, Supreme Court justices. So now they're not. Now you have all three, and, and judges as well. So you don't have, all, now you don't have a republic anymore. You have a central executive branch that can do whatever they want. So if you have political capital, meaning you're popular, you have a high popularity with the, with the people, and you control the legislative branch, and you appointed the right justices and judges, that's that's not a that's not a democracy anymore. That's not a republic anymore. That's just plain dictatorship. So that's that's how the corruption of the Workers Party was different from all other corruptions. So they didn't stop. They were they were caught. So what they started doing is the what became the, the then Operation Car Wash that um, became very famous. Um, what, what they found out is that. They changed the method a little bit. 
Operation Car Wash, obviously because this is a money laundering scheme of sorts. <laughs> no, it was it was it was because it started investigated on a car wash, an actual car wash okay. in the south of the country, and they found out there was a guy that was laundering money in the, in this little car wash. And when they caught this guy, this guy uh, pleads uh, a, a deal with the DA and appointed other guys, and and who appointed other guys, and he came all the way to the present. To Lula, and that's that was part of uh, what sent him to jail, but uh, to prison. But what 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 they were doing is that since they couldn't send money directly to the guys in Congress, so they started financing their campaigns. So okay, you vote with me, and I'll raise funds for your campaign. Not officially, everything off the books, okay, but I will give you money for your campaign. So this way, they could have the votes, but not only that, they could help elect the people that they wanted financing their campaigns off the books. So the way it worked was that they had huge construction contracts with other brash, like big contractors, huge construction contracts with them and several other contracts as well, pension funds and all that. But the, the contractor would donate money f to fund the campaigns of the candidates supported by Lula. So that was even better because they not only they had the votes that they needed in Congress, so they, they bought out Congress as well again, second time, but they could elect the candidates they wanted. So it was even better. So, uh, and, and that was, that was people, so again, different type of corruption. Not only a guy getting rich, not only a corrupt politician getting rich, we're talking about the, the republic being subverted again. And they use, they use money to, f to fund other socialist countries. So Brazil sent an immense amount of money to Venezuela. Brazil uh, had a program with doctors. It's called More Doctors. Brazil hired s thousands of doctors from Cuba because you know how the health system in Cuba is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about it. It's, like, it's total false. It's, it's a piece of crap. But Brazil hired thousands of doctors from Cuba. This is a true story. Cuba was almost bankrupt, okay? Castro was still alive back then. Uh, Cuba was bankrupt. Brazil hired thousands of doctors from Cuba, and they came to work in Brazil with a workers' visa, with a work, working visa. Okay, but they didn't receive the the salary monthly. They received a small percentage of it. The rest of it was sent to the Cuban government, because you know how Cuba Cuban government owned. Cuban people, yeah. at least in, in, in the mind of Lula. This program res, is resumed now, but it, uh, through... It's, it subsidized the Cuban government. Yeah, through Brazilian taxpayers' money. So Was it was this known publicly at the time? Oh, yeah. And, and, and sold as... This, this is, is starting the, again. Lula, now that Lula is the president again, he resumed the more doctors program with Cuban doctors. To subsidize what was Fidel Castro's regime at the yes, time. Yes, yes. So Brazilians are responsible for everything that happens in Cuba. So all the human rights violations that are happening in Cuba are being at least partially subsidized. They were funded by Brazilian taxpayers through Lula. Okay, but, uh, what is the Brazilian population saying at the time this is going on? If it's a known policy, I mean, is, is the defense for the people that, well, we didn't know that not all the money was going to the doctors. We thought we were paying no, the doctors. No, 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 it was we, open. We, okay. <laughs> this is like so. It's a it's social a social welfare at an international scale. Where now we're going to go help Cuba, yeah, and prop up what would otherwise be a failed regime. We also funded the construction of their port. We also funded the subway of Caracas. We also funded like stuff in Peru. So every social name a socialist country. We were funding their um, construction, their programs, and once you send the money abroad. You don't have any control, right? So it's over there. So what's done with the money, we don't know. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Like, what what would be the 
ulterior motive for Lula. That if he sends all the money abroad, uh, he doesn't benefit directly. What is the incentive to subsidize? I think it does benefit socialism? directly because, um, well, he's funding his supporters, his international supporters from the left. So he wants, he doesn't want Cuba to become a democracy uh, and have a, let's say, a right-wing president. Uh, it's, he doesn't want Venezuela to become a democracy and have a right-wing president. So he was supporting his pals, his, his friends, his buddies, uh, uh, with with Brazilian taxpayer money. And he's doing it again. He well, was, so actually, you have to finish up on the Operation Car Wash. So this, in, this scandal is discovered. It's just, you know, iteration 2.0 of misappropriating, funneling monies, not only buying off the legislative branch for legislative purposes, but effectively influencing who gets elected. Yes. There's, there's versions of that in, in, in America where, you know, some people uh, allege that some individuals finance the campaigns of uh, certain candidates and you end up getting a very corrupt DA system, judicial system, etc. What, what's the outcome of, of Operation Carl? It goes to the courts and Lula ends up in jail for was supposed to be 12 years? I think Operation Car Wash started in a very nice way. Okay, Young um, prosecutors, uh, they didn't want corruption in Brazil to become... It reached the point that was... The tipping point, as we say. The tipping point, yeah. It was, it was unbelievable. And everyone knew. And everyone knew that to do anything with the Workers' Party government, you wouldn't have to give them a percentage. They would use that money to stay in power and all that. So it, it became with a lot of support from all from everyone in the country, including myself. Uh, but at one point it became very politicized and they started um, because they had a lot of support from the media and from the population, from, from people. To fight back against this institutionalized corruption. I think the next sentence is going to be they went too far and they went too over far. prosecuted. Over prosecuted. And made a, made a very angry man out of Lula and an angry political party machine when it came back into power. True. Okay. But they they violated every every civil right you can imagine. And they violated with bad people, but with remember good people as well, right? You have the have this thing in the western world that we we'd rather uh uh, have a thousand witches like uh, running away than to burn an innocent uh, woman, right? Uh, and in Brazil, uh, we burned a lot of innocent women <laughs> so in the this process. Is, this is the irony is that in fighting corruption, the prosecution became just as corrupt, if not more so, with a vengeance. Um, and from what I understood, uh, there was corruption in the prosecution, corruption in the... No, in, not, that, not, not like they, they were bribed. Although they had a lot of incentives, some of them were giving speeches and receiving like an immense amount of money to, for, for lectures, speeches, and, and all that. Uh, but th there, was a, there was a corruption in the sense of, um, of corrupting a system, right? And, and this is what Glenn Greenwald talked about in our interview. Yes. In going after Lula, they, you know, they, their He's power absolutely was unchecked. Correct. So th they, oh, they abused of their power, um, but ultimately prosecuted, convicted, and Lula went to jail. Not only Lula, it, they convicted the guys, I'm talking billionaires from the construction companies, several congressmen, mem, uh, several congress members, uh, senators, former ministers of Lula. Uh, I mean, they had, I don't know, 79 faces of this operation. I don't know, I don't even know how many. Uh, but everyone was going to jail okay. and became a witch hunt. At one point, it did become a witch hunt. And, and Lula was convicted as well. But to my surprise, Lula was never convicted for, I don't know, sending money to Cuba or uh, corrupting the republic. Or No, he was convicted for having a condo. It was not a super wealthy condo that apparently was given by him, uh, given to him by one of the construction companies and he didn't have it under he, he his name. He didn't declare it as a gift or? or no, whatever. he didn't have, it was not under his name officially, but a lot of witnesses said it belonged to him. And it was like, yeah, come on, this is like, this is very weak. But the problem was not only that. The problem is that, well, you're a lawyer, so you can explain better than myself. 
But Lula lived in Brasilia, and he's from Sao Paulo. This condo was in Sao Paulo. So you can say that the judge that's going to conduct this case is either going to be in Brasilia or in Sao Paulo. But for some reason, they found a way to bring the case to Sergio Moro, which was the judge that was overseeing everything related to Operation Car Wash, seeing, saying he was the natural judge. Mm -hmm. But he was not. Well, so it, it's interesting. Look, uh, for it, only from a Canadian legal perspective, typically, you know, when it comes to real property, then you could be where the real property is situated or yes. where the defendant resides. Yes, that's this, what I said. Uh, th this sounds like... If from what I'm understanding of what you're saying, it's okay, we want to get a judge who we know is going to be harsh on Lula exactly. on the file. Yeah. So let's find a way to give him jurisdiction. It could maybe it could be done. It could be done. And then this happens. This happens. But this ultimately becomes the basis of um, yes. what's the word? Ex not exonerating, but rather undoing the conviction, which they said was had no jurisdiction. He was wrongly convicted. And that's how And he just... was. And he was. And on the top of that, he was wrongly convicted from a procedural perspective. The lawyer, you know, you have to follow the two things. The guy needs to be guilty, but also you need to follow due process, right? If you if you don't, you need both. You can have just one, right? Um, and we did not follow due process with Lula. And I was one of the only guys on the right saying that, and it was crucified uh, for saying that. Like, like, I hate this guy. I want him to rot in jail, but we're not doing it the right way. This is it's the O.J. Simpson phenomenon where as guilty as he might have been doesn't mean you can plant evidence to exactly. make sure that you convict. Exactly. Um, and so he, Lula, and he spends, uh, what is it, less than two years in jail? Yes, he went to a, I said prison, but it was the, the it was actual jail. Okay. Because he, it was, so then th some weird things started happening. Uh, that's when things, weird things start happening. Because Lula going to jail was... It was a th the establishment supported uh, Lula going to jail. Mm -hmm. They threw Lula under the bus, okay? So it had all the business elites, the mainstream media, the oligarchs, everyone. Like, yeah, we should just uh, kill Lula, send him to jail, let's get rid of him. It's like, okay, the media is saying that. So we all know the media is all left, so why are they saying that? And even the, the prosecutors, I knew they were not conservative people, but they wanted to get rid of Lula politically. So what did they expect? We really told you, Brazil was always divided between workers' party, left, ultra-left, like socialist party, and the social democrats, which is more like a globalist, woke, social, it's, like, it's more like Trudeau in a sense. Well, Trudeau is, is going more and more towards full com communist. It's like with every, back with to his origins, <laughs> if I can say that. Okay. For those who don't get the joke, there's a rumor that Fidel Castro is Justin Trudeau's natural father. I You're saying it, I, I, it. I, I've read it. I don't, I, I don't think it's true, but who knows? There are a lot of similarities if you do side by side. Yes. Comparison, no, just, but just, it's an internet meme. Just, yeah, just look it up. Just, <laughs> just look at the pictures and no, come to your I, own conclusion. I'm not saying he looks more like Fidel than Pierre Elliott, but he doesn't yeah. look much like Pierre Elliott. Yeah. I'm not entertaining this people seriously, although Google the images. You'll see. Okay, yes. sorry. Well, so Brazil was divided between Workers' Party and Social Democrats. So everyone thought that when we got rid of the Workers' Party, who would come back? Social Democrats. Of course. It's been like that for... 25 years. So this is what people thought. But then, I, I mean, Andrew Claven has a very smart analogy that he says that uh, Donald Trump, it's like Godzilla, that, that he was, the, the, the Democratic Party created Donald Trump with their radioactive experiments, uh, like, like same, same way as Godzilla with the radioactive experiments in the islands in, in the Pacific. So Bolsonaro was kind of like Brazil's Godzilla as well. So people were like, we don't want the Social Democratic Party. We don't want uh, the, the, the Workers' Party for sure. So we want something different. And that's how Bolsonaro got into power. This is like the, the, the click when things finally click, where now it makes sense where they say, okay, we don't like Lula. We want to get the Social Democrats back in. So in, in a sense, we're, uh, we're taking out one guy just because we know who's going to replace him. And then lo and behold, 
Bolsonaro somehow gets elected and now they don't even have the social democrats in power. Yeah, because society has, has changed in Brazil. So the uh, the evangelical churches were growing a lot. So evangelical Christians tend to be more conservative. Same as in the US, the same same as elsewhere uh, everywhere else in the world, right? It's impo almost impossible to be a Christian and a leftist. Um, also uh, with the internet, the mainstream media lost the monopoly of of the, the the public discussion of the speech of the ideas, right? So you start having um, independent journalists um, in Brazil. Um, you also have Olavo de Cavalho, the philosopher I told you about. His ideas uh, are becoming more and more popular. So you have all these changes. And Bolsonaro, he was a congressman, uh, very, very, had a very minor part in Congress, but he was very conservative and spoke his mind very honest. So he was already, I mean, I, I don't know what his political history was, but he's already been involved in politics. He's for been a congress for like over 20 years. Okay. Congressman, yeah. And but he was like a congressman that represented the military people, just a small percentage. He was very well voted in in uh, 2014, I believe. Uh, but in 2018, he said, I'm going to run for president. And no one really believed. It was kind of like Donald Trump. I, I mean, the analogy between Bolsonaro and Donald Trump is very good in, 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 in some aspects and very bad in other aspects. That's why it's an, an analogy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but in, in that sense, when he started, it was like people thought he was a joke. And then it was like the polls were saying like, it's like, that's 20%, there's no chance of winning. And the establishment, everyone was laughing, saying, oh no, the guy who's gonna win is the former governor of Sao Paulo of the Social Democratic Party, who is now the vice president of Lula, by the way, mm -hmm. okay, because the Social Democratic Party, the Workers' Party, they're together it, now. The, the media got what they wanted. It just took it just took an extra five years. Exactly. Okay. That, and, and so Lula comes out, and I understand like it's he's he's not uh, not sorry not Lula. Bolsonaro comes out, says he's running, not taken seriously, um, uses social media from what I understand it, very effectively. Um, okay, where Lula right now has gotten out of jail for he got out of jail when like. So I believe it was in 2019 or 2020. So at one point, the establishment, let me use this word very loosely, but I'm going to include the media, the, 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 the academia, the, the oligarchs, the, the financial sector, everyone's okay. The establishment realized that, oh, this is not what we wanted. Okay, this this guy is nuts. This Bolsonaro is nuts. He's weird. He's like behaving in a weird way. It's like there's a statical, like I don't know. People don't like him. The way he looks, the way he speaks, okay, more more than his ideas. And people, the media went nuts with him. And and so they are like, okay, we need to get rid of him. Who 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 can defeat him? And they tried several names. But none of them had any uh, any uh, appeal to the people, okay. And Lula still had a big recall, and so the polls were showing that Lula still had forty percent of the voters, or something like that, even with the corruption. And you can trust or distrust the polls. I'm I'm more I'm more towards distrust. But Lula always had a political cap. Was always popular in Brazil at, at a certain point. Then weird things start happening. Under Brazilian constitution, you're only guilty. You're only uh, guilty. Uh, you're innocent until proven guilty. Okay, same, same, pretty much same as here. But you're only found guilty ever after the last appeal. So you have all the appeals. I don't know the technical terms. Yeah, but I mean they, they say like. Final appeals. I mean, so long as it can be challenged. So as long no as it can be challenged, you're, you're innocent. Okay? okay. Under it's written in, in 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 the Brazilian Constitution. So because of that, there's a discussion. If you can be sent to when can you when can a judge send you to jail? Okay. So you have uh, the the what they used a lot in Operation Car Wash, and they used much more than the the law allowed them to was uh, 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 a preemptive arrest. Mm -hmm. You have a chance to, to destroy evidence when you can 
um, run away or stuff like that. They used that a lot in the Operation Car Wash. But Lula, no. Lula was convicted. So the understanding that the Supreme Court had back then was that, well, not after the first judge, because you don't have a jury trial in Brazil with uh, some exceptions, but not with the first judge, but after you go to appeals panel of judges, after they convict you, then they can send you to jail. And that's how Lula went to jail, to prison actually, okay? But he went to jail. He was in a federal police building. Uh, and that was the understanding until 2020. Then the Supreme Court, because of Lula's case, of course, they decided to revisit the case, the discussion. And they said, no, 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 it's, it's what the Constitution says. It's until your final appeal. So meaning in Brazil, you have the federal judge, then you have the appeals court, then you have the su superior court of justice, then you have the Supreme Court, and everyone can appeal to the Supreme Court. It's not, it's not like they, can, they have to, to, to grant you the, the, what do you call it here? Uh, the uh, certi certiorari, I think. Certi they, they, they don't need Give from, cert, yeah. yeah. You don't have to. They, okay. Everyone can appeal to the Supreme Court uh, in Brazil. So you have to, and after that, you have also other certain appeal types that only you lawyers uh, can figure out. But it's, it's a very long process. It can take over 10 years, easily. Okay. So they decided, well, Lula was not convicted until... He still has some rights of appeal, so let him let, go. Let me go. Let him go. Well, that, was, that was before and after that, few, a couple, I think a year later, a year after that, then they decided to nullify Lula's all trials, okay? Remember, he was convicted by a federal judge, by an appeals court unanimously, by the superior courts of justice, but a, by a panel of judges as well, unanimously. And he had another case that he was convicted twice, involving, involving a country house in, a, in Sao Paulo as well. But he, he had all these convictions, and they said, you know what? You were, you were, you did, Sergio Moro, you didn't have jurisdiction over this case. And people were like, oh, what? The lawyers challenged the jurisdiction in the beginning of the trial. It was, ra it was ratified back then. It was then. ratified back then. And then they come back after and say, oh, wrong jurisdiction. He never had the right to convict anyhow. Yes. Not, not just let him out, tear it up. Tear it up. It's like, it was, it was like he was, and then he was sent back to the original judge in Brasilia, which, Yes, he was the correct judge to oversee this case, but then he was too old. I was going to say at that point, I, I, there might be some double jeopardy issues in there. No, because he was the 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 the, the trial was found new, new. Yeah. So it was like he was never tried, so he can be tried again, but you you would have to start over. But he was over seventy something years, and there's a prescription. This is all post Bolsonaro being elected. Yes. Right? Okay, and then we skipped over an important thing. So Bolsonaro. Outlier of outliers, a la Trump. This is two years after Trump, so we're seeing something of what they call the populist movement, not just in America, Brazil, no. uh, in Europe. We'd seen it a little earlier. He gets elected, uh, despite all odds, but he got stabbed during his... Uh, yeah. I, I don't think most people know this. Yes. Now, he, while he's running the first time, before he got elected in 2018, gets stabbed in the chest by... Um, uh, what's described as a lefty maniac. A lone, yeah, a yeah. Lone, uh, a lone wolf. Yeah, well, the guy was... Uh, uh, he was he had all connections with the left and with the leftist parties and and he was arrested of course but they investigated him and found out that he was a lone wolf uh with mental issues it's, it's almost almost like the exact type of person media and politics tries to uh radicalize um oh by the way the guy who was in charge of uh the investigation the the federal police uh chief He's now the chief of intelligence in the in Lula's government. That the guy who was in charge of the investigation. Lily Tomlin said, "No matter how cynical you are, it's tough to keep up." Um, so a, a lone wolf who may or may not have been radicalized by the rabid. I imagine it's rabid, twenty four seven, incessant anti Bolsonaro. It's the end of times if he gets elected. Yep. Gets stabbed in the chest. Seriously, in the abdomen. It, in the abdomen. It was serious. It wasn't like a, he almost died. Almost died. And then, until and then, and then until gets, today, he has 
uh, health issues. Health issues. Yeah, he was here in the U.S. And he went he to was the in the hospital. Yeah. People were hypothesizing as to why he went to the hospital. No, it was for that reason. Ask him. And he was uh, he was having an obstruction because when they he, they did surgery and he had to they had to reconstruct his intestines. And you have a risk, a subsequent risk of stomach yes. blockages. Yes, yes, exactly. That's what we had. And from time to time, it's it's kind of sad because you have dinner with the guy. And the guy was like, "No, I can't eat at night because I don't I don't feel well." So it's like still is still have uh, some side effects from from. But after I mean I say but after getting stabbed all of that. And you, a, and you believe that the left said it was fake? It was all staged. I I could believe. We live in a world now where I, I yeah. Uh, not that course. I could believe it could be the case. I understand no, but you believe, how people believe it. It's, yes. it's 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 like sort of the Alex Jones phenomenon where you end up looking for conspiracies beyond the realm within. Hey, the, Except the, Alex Jones was right eighty percent of the time. I say maybe maybe even more, but the one where he was wrong, well that that yes. would be his downfall. Yes. Right, that is going to be the attempt to bring him down. But no, I can understand people like, it's like blue screen, holograph, whatever. Yes. Um, as opposed to the actual conspiracy, which is it wasn't a lone wolf, and even if it was, or even if it were, that's the result of twenty four seven absolute demonizing from the media, from politicians, creating the existential threat where you trigger people to do these things. I, I think we need to be careful with with the, the with the concept that uh, media is responsible for other people's behavior. I, I, because I've been I, I've been accused of that. The, so on the other side, they accuse me of propagating ideas that made people invade the capital in Brazil. It was like, well, it was true, like, but you know what the funny thing is, uh, and I and I agree with you that uh, you know reasonable words, when heard unreasonably, uh, the person who uttered those reasonable words is is not to be blamed for anything. Right. When the media, you know, looks at alternative uh, personalities and says, "Well, if you spend so much time criticizing, what do you think is going to happen?" It is a bit of the confession through projection, where right. when you have the Rachel Maddow and you have the Brian Stelters of the world who spend all day every day, you know, letting people know. 12 years left on earth if this politician gets elected, you can reasonably anticipate. It's not to blame them legally or, or may, maybe morally for creating a panic. True. Um, yeah, so it was not a question of actually attributing responsibility to the media. Just contextually, that's how it happened. That's how it went down. It, it did, yeah. And I, I don't mean, from a cynical perspective, like the old expression. I, I, I think it was actually, it was actually planned. I, 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 I believe it was, there's evidence, including high-profile lawyers just showing up that no one know who was paying the lawyers showing up to defend the guys like and and his cell phone he had like I don't know how many cell phones international credit cards like it's, he, this guy was funded this was planned he 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 went to a shooting range with uh, the the Bolsonaro's sons used to go before so he was like it was planned I believe it was planned um, it was definitely definitely not a lone wolf and I asked Bolsonaro that. A couple of weeks ago, I asked, what do, you, what do you think? It was like, yeah, no, no, it was planned by the left. It's the, um, but then I can also see how someone on the left is going to say, it was planned by Bolsonaro because it got him sympathy votes and he got elected. Jesus Christ. I, I, no, I, no. I, have, you heard, have you heard people say that? I, I have. <laughs> It's like, it's, it's, yeah, right. If, if you want to, how much one, do you want? That's one to, heck of an, an investment in your political future. Yes. There's the old expression of the best fundraising trick is to throw a brick through your own window and say, yes. but then there's levels. I mean, there's, and, you know, we had an incident in Canada in the early days of the pandemic, uh, the Nova Scotia shooter. I'm not sure if you ever heard about this, but, um, you know, the guy went on a shooting spree in Nova Scotia, rural Nova Scotia, killed like, I want to say 20, some, you know, close to 20 people, if it wasn't 20, over 24 hours, driving an RCMP lookalike vehicle, wearing an RCMP uniform, if it wasn't an actual one. And, you know, they, say, they, they, they sweep it under the rug and say, it's a gun issue. And Justin right. Trudeau exploited it for that. Not, not paying attention to the fact that this individual withdrew $400,000 from a private wealth management bank a couple of days earlier, and there's only so many ways that happens. A very, very scandalous, suspicious story that gets swept under the rug and exploited for political purposes. But yeah, to believe that this guy's a lone wolf and has all of these indications that you've mentioned. I don't believe so. My, my, my suspicious bells are going and off. Then, and then the guy who was in charge of the investigation is now the head of uh, intelligence for the federal well, isn't police. That con isn't that con politically oh, convenient, <laughs> yes. as we say? Okay, terrible. But he gets elected, becomes uh, president of Brazil, 2018, and the elections that we just had, and this is where, you know, people became wise, or this is where people became conscious of Brazil was this last election. What was Bolsonaro's presidency like? 
It was not bad, but it, it was not, especially in the beginning, was not great because, because of several reasons. Okay, Bolsonaro is a great guy. He's a very good person, has uh, very good values, but he was definitely not prepared for the job in several senses. Okay, for example, he, when he got elected, he decided to antagonize the Congress, and that was not a smart thing to what do. What do you mean by anti? How did he do that? Well, with with verbal, like rhetoric. verbally, with a. He was not good. I mean, when you're a president, part of your job is dealing with Congress. And you need to get along with them, at least in, in a certain sense. And to Bolsonaro's defense, Brazilian Congress was the same Congress that, in a sense, or at least partially, same Congress that was used to receiving bribe and cash until a few years before. So they were used to a dynamic that Bolsonaro was not going to be part of. Okay, So he was not, he was not giving them positions in the government. Uh, he was antagonizing them verbally. Every time he and the Congress had a disagreement, he, he took the populist uh, route, which was he asked the people to go to the streets and, and demand things from, from Congress. Not a smart strategy. He should have uh, followed the Justin Trudeau strategy, which is not to get involved in protests to affect policy change. Just stay at home and phone your government. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> of um, course. So he, he's... he's, he's in, in some sense, um, defying the government and I encouraging upheaval on the streets yeah. for political change. Yes, that was, that was the 2019 was a lot of that. A lot of fights with the Congress. Uh, he didn't have a party. So Bolsonaro, he never had a party. So he was always, always jumping from party to parties. So he didn't have a political base. He didn't have people to put in the government because he was never in power. So if, if you think about it, when Donald Trump got elected, uh, Okay, he never worked in politics, but he had the Republican Party, the largest party in the world that had a lot of governors, had people in previous administrations. So you need to fulfill key positions and you have people because managing is managing anything is having the right people. Yeah, and, and one of the biggest criticisms of Trump is that he didn't clean house and put in the right people. Um, because who, who would he call? Right, he all, he had to look to the previous administration. So it was like, okay, who do we have in the Republican Party? Oh, okay, we have this guy from uh, work with George Bush. It's like, uh, okay, I don't like George Bush a lot, but still, he is he's a Republican, and this guy has all the credentials. So let me put him in this key position, and then you find out that this guy is like deep state, like. <laughs> He, he's a POS. I, I'm, th I'm thinking of a, a number of yes, things, which I won't mention yet. Yes, I'm, I'm not as well. But he, you know what I'm talking about. Bolsonaro didn't have that. So he turned, a lot of times he turned to the military because he was a, he's a former captain from the army. So he looked in, into the military and he found uh, military officials to fulfill key positions. And, 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 and the, the first year of Bolsonaro's government, 2019, was him antagonizing the Congress, a lot of income... Uh, not competent people in, in key positions like the Ministry of Education was a guy like completely it was an intellectual guy but he couldn't run uh, a department you know so it was a lot of that 2019 on 2020 things started changing I think Bolsonaro started to realize what was the what, would, what, what, the, what was the job like a little bit uh, but then COVID happened mm -hmm. And COVID was a shit show for every president, prime minister in the world. Um, it was not great politically. It doesn't mean if, it doesn't matter if you were on the left or the right. You suffered political damage. But I, I mean, I was watching. I watched your um, podcast with Patrick Bet David, and and I think he made the point, or someone on the panel made the point that Bolsonaro's mismanagement of mismanagement in quotes of the pandemic was basically how it was governed in Florida. Yes. And so mismanagement, because it, it, it's like... It, but with, with, a, with a, I think Bolsonaro didn't have a, I mean, from a PR perspective, he's not Ron DeSantis. Well, well that's what I'm not, that's what I'm going to say is he, he may not be Ron DeSantis, for, I, I don't know, from a charismatic or PR perspective, but he's facing the same He's thing, better is, from a charismatic perspective, but the PR, he never had good PR. Well, and, and, and that's when the media comes out and says, You're, you, you, want, you want Granny to die. This is the type of mismanagement. Yes. To shut down everything, shut down schools, and then when that turns out to be the problem, then they'll turn on you also. But okay, 
pandemic hits, uh, he wants to have a more, uh, not a full crippling, debilitating, destructive lockdown, its mandates, etc. <laughs> and now Brazil is now waking up with the inverse of that nightmare under what Lula is currently doing. Uh, and then, so what happens during the pandemic? And then how, do, how does it get into the next election? So Brazil doesn't have the same system as in the U.S. where the states like have a lot of uh, are independent on how they run their COVID policies. That's not what's written under Brazilian law. But the Supreme Court decided that's the, that was going to be the case because Bolsonaro was the president. So he didn't have any control uh, of the country's policy. So Brazil did have a very strict lockdowns, mask vaccines, everything, vaccines, passports, everything that you can imagine. Uh, not as, not, I believe, almost as bad as Canada, okay, you, depending you, on the state. Did you have curfew? <laughs> we, we had, we had. At one point in the, in, the, in, the, in the south of the country, we had complete curfew. You couldn't go out to buy basic goods, not even grocery. In, in a, well, during sure, a certain I, Then point. I shouldn't complain about what we had in Quebec because I was still allowed going out during the day, freely. No. I, mean, I, I was free to go out during the day. In it, some it, states, It sounds like no. Australia, what you had. Yes, in some states. It, it depended from state to state. But, uh, and that was because of, and Bolsonaro was very much against it. At one point, he, he thought about decla declaring some sort of martial law or some sort of federal intervention to protect people's rights, but he ended up not doing it. Uh, but he he mentioned that he was thinking about doing it, uh, and and but that was it was it was very bad. And in the meantime, it's, things are complicated, right? The left doesn't attack you only one way. So using COVID and using the way the Bolsonaro was dealing with COVID, they opened a like a like a like a commission, in, like a like a parliament commission to investigate uh, the way he was conducting the pandemic response. And that was on TV every day. Like, 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 like the January 6th. Exactly committee. like the January 6th. Would you say that, I'd say the left, I mean, it's, I'll say politics, but right now it happens to be the left that are in power and control the media and merge all of those things into the holy trifecta of an attack. But I'll say Bolsonaro is mismanaging the pandemic. So we're going to basically uh, handicap him for all his powers and, and give those powers to the states because and, it's not going to do anything because we've seen the lockdowns, you know, have done minimal. They haven't done minimal damage. They've done a lot of damage. Mask mandates did, had had no effect. The numbers are not going to be any better, but they can still blame all of the failings on yes, Bolsonaro to begin yes. with. Create a commission, political witch hunt, which we've now known Brazil is good for, as as are other jurisdictions. Yes. And then use a weaponized media to run it 24-7 and beat it into the brains of, of the general population. That's exactly what happened. And but also, that's one side of the equation, but also uh, in 2019... And that's when things started to derail in Brazil from a civil rights per perspective. The Supreme Court opened the fake news probe. Okay, so that's, that's complicated, but you're a lawyer. I'm going to try to explain it to you. So people, when Bolsonaro got elected, people started looking for excuses. So right. Russian, right. Russian collusion was <laughs> yeah. not, in, not on the table. But the same, I mean, sometimes it's, I get tired uh, to compare uh, Brazilian politics and U.S. politics, but they're very similar because the tactics are exactly the same. So they started blaming on the Internet. They were like blaming on all, all these uh, Cambridge Analytics. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, uh, they started blaming on people using the Internet to propagate fake news. Yeah. Okay. So Bolsonaro and Trump, they got elected because people are too dumb and they don't know what they're getting and they got a lot of fake news from the internet. So we got to investigate that. And they, by the way, they're using these fake news to attack the Supreme Court. And by attack, I mean saying bad things about the Supreme Court. Okay, so they're defamating the Supreme Court. So as... A lawyer, you know, a court cannot start an investigation, right? We have an accusatory system. So, but the Supreme Court got very creative here. And I have to, I have to give them. That was like very creative. There was on the, on the bylaws of the court, of the Supreme Court, there's a provision that if a crime happens within premises of the court, they can open an investigation. Well, now I know exactly where they're going to go. A defamation against the court? 
is sufficient uh, Supreme Court jurisdiction to recommend opening an investigation into it. It could happen anywhere. But they did it better. They opened the investigation themselves. So now, (laughs) listen, it's amazing. Who's who's the chief justice of the equivalent of the Supreme Court? It's Well, in Brazil, back then, the, the guy who was in charge was... They nominated a guy called Alexandre de Moraes. Very important name. De Moraes is M O R A E S. Yes. Okay. To be the head of this investigation of the fake news probe. Okay. So on the fake news probes, the probe, they were the victims, they were the judges, they were the, in- investigators, the investigators, and the complainants, and the prosecutors. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. That's justice right there. That's how you protect. Your All freedoms <laughs> by by violating them left, right, and center. Okay. Yes. And by the way, all the files of the investigations were secret. So uh, like sealed. Sealed. Oh my goodness. This is now another piece of the puzzle just clicked. So this is going to explain all of the injunctions that were issued by the court that could deplatform people. Yes. Shut down I mean I shut down websites. Uh, create causes of defamation or allege that certain statements are defamatory. And now this is going to explain why you probably cannot go back to Brazil. Yes. Okay. So, so that, I'm, I'm, su- that. I'm suing 2019. So okay. they opened the fake news probe and they start going after Bolsonaro supporters on in every field you can imagine. Okay. They went after journalists. They went after uh, media personalities, social media personalities. They went after businessmen that supported Bolsonaro. They went after everyone. I'm talking about donors as well, I presume. Donors. Well, Bolsonaro didn't have exactly donors, but he had businessmen to support his causes. Because in Brazil, you cannot donate, a a, a company cannot donate money to a campaign. Individuals can, a small amount of money, but uh, not 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 companies. That's because um, the campaigns back, are funded by the, by the treasury. They, they the owe a lot of private monies into it, and it's, yes. it's taxpayer that funds. Yeah. Well, they still do, but it's off the books. Okay. <laughs> like when you when you when you prohibit something, this is what happens, right? It, it, it keeps happening, but it's off the books, uh, and only to the government government friends, right? But anyways, this is what happened, and then uh, they they started. Um, the, with this probe, and uh, the first effect that you have is a big chilling effect, okay? So everyone that supports Bolsonaro start thinking twice because you have search warrants uh, in houses, uh, some it's arrest exactly warrants. exactly like what they did with Trump. It's like let, sending a message, if you are a supporter yes. or, or a, what's the word, an ally, you're on the radar, and if you're thinking about it, don't donate. You're, you're, you, in, in America, your address will be doxed, and et cetera, et yes. cetera. Okay. Same thing. And they and then they, they started this. Remember, I also told you that Bolsonaro used to call people to demonstrate on their si- streets their will and their demands, right? The right to peacefully um, present, assemble, assemble yeah. and present your your requests. Protest. Right? It's known as protest. Exactly. And mo- most free societies tolerate it. Yes, but then they opened another a second probe. Main, same justice opened a second probe. Uh, which was the anti-democratic demonstration probe. Okay, so you have anti-democratic demonstrations because what people are requesting <laughs> is not democratic. <laughs> I'm not making this I, up. This, I mean, I think Justin Trudeau learned a couple of lessons. Yeah, from this. of think, course he did. You can protest so long as we approve of it, and it's within the parameters that we establish for you. And and we and you go home when we tell you to, and uh, you don't make more noise than we allow you to. Okay, so he's, so Bra- no- you know Brazil and Canada are like the top countries in juristocracy, right? Brazil and Canada. There's a there's a guy who wrote a book, uh, Hen Ruschel, uh Jewish guy, Israeli guy as well. Uh, he uh, a book, very good book. It's towards juristocracy, and he explains how Canada and Brazil are like the top countries. If if that book is on audiobook, I'll, it, give, it I'll give it a listen. It is, and you're gonna love it. Okay, I always wanted to to recommend this book to you. What? Uh, well, you'll you'll give it to me after the podcast. Yes. we're gonna do this. Yeah, Han Rear Show uh, towards the aristocracy. Towards towards juristocracy. Juristocracy. I like that. Okay. It's it's very good. You're gonna you're gonna love it. So I think it's one of the most important books written in the past years, um, from a, both legal and political perspective. I think the guy, the I, I think here she was a professor in. University of Toronto, one okay. of them. Uh, but anyways, so he opened this anti-democratic acts probe, and 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 
again, more and more people being prosecuted and, and investigated and they didn't have, the lawyers didn't have access to what the charges were because there were no charges. At one point, the Department of Justice, which was supposed to prosecute, said, we're not prosecuting uh, because we were not, we, we, we were supposed to be the only authority, the only institution that can prosecute someone and you're prosecuting by yourself. So, so this is wrong from a, from a from procedural perspective since the beginning. So this is all gonna be new. So it's just like, this is invalid, what, what are you doing? But they didn't care because there's the Supreme Court, they can do whatever they want. So they're the final instance for appeal. All records were sealed, secret, classified, whatever you call. Uh, lawyers didn't have access to the charges. Uh, people were not, people were not charged per se. Right, because just, just investigated indefinitely. Exactly. And then if they don't get you on the whatever charges they were, they'll get you on the procedure misleading, lying to the whatever you, the Brazilian FBI equivalent is. Yes. So what what he did is that he he brought a part of the federal police. He brought one chief to, to work to work to work directly under him. So he had his own police working. I know the police is um, part of the executive branch. But we have a part of the federal police in Brazil that answers to the judiciary branch directly. So they and he appointed a guy, actually it was a lady that he was that he liked. So the chief of police was making the request and he were he was granting the request. But the chief of police was a person he appointed. So he was making the requests using the federal police and they were granting. So and and this is still ha I said was but it is that's the, the, the it's still ongoing. Okay. Um, phenomenal. I mean, it's it's we're seeing iterations of this everywhere in the states in Canada. Uh, but I didn't get to my passport uh, yet because. Okay. Well, here, so continue <laughs> with the. <laughs> well, it's it's a long thing. A lot of things happen. Uh, they freed Lula. There's a big part of it that was that is related to. They freed Lula. And the rationale, they freed him and, and basically uh, nullified his conviction yes. on the basis that jurisdictional, because otherwise, he w if he had had the conviction stand... They never found him innocent or not guilty. Yeah, no, no, but my understanding is that unless they had found a way to nullify the conviction, he would not have been able to run again. Oh, no, because Brazil, under, under Brazilian law, you cannot run for president if you've been convicted okay. by a panel of judges. So this is, I mean, it's just, they learned the lesson the first time. If, if, if we're not going to have the social democrat guy replace Lula. We're now going to have Lula replace Bolsonaro because he's the only guy that can do it. He's the only him. guy that can do it. He's got a little thing preventing him, which is that conviction. So let's find a way to nullify that conviction. Oh, yeah, jurisdictional procedure was not respected. Nullification. Can't retry him again because he's too old. Now he gets to run again with a media that's learned its lesson, with a judiciary that's operating full throttle behind him, uh, with, I guess, police that are also working behind him. Uh, trying to outlaw social media platforms, uh, you know, suppress social media discourse, prevent anybody from criticizing the government or the judiciary, and Lula. There's also one. There's one piece left, huh? which is the electoral system, because Bolsonaro was still very popular, and Lula was popular as well, but Bolsonaro might defeat Lula again, and then who would they have? So, and they need to. They they can't take any risks. They can't take any chances. So in Brazil, the electoral system is a beauty. It's all electronic. So there's no paper trail. And it's all controlled by one court, which is the Supreme Electoral Court. Who was the president of the Supreme Electoral Court on the last election? De Moraes. I was going to say it, I was, but I, I was going to say it, and then I was going to... No, that's too I, absurd. Right? One, le one level or to say, a Lula supporter. De Moraes, the judiciary guy. Yes, remember, in the Supreme Court, Lula or uh, Lula's allies, Dilma, and uh, they appointed nine out, out of our 11 judges, justices. They appointed nine out of, out of our 11. Okay, so, so that says a lot. Uh, but uh, they have, Brazil has a system completely electronic. And a lot of people complain because if it's all electronic and it's centralized in one core that oversees and come up with all the rules and everything, it's very easy to fraud, 
right? It's it, it goes without saying the absence of a paper trail. Exactly. The, the the digital voting is one thing. The you know the not matching signatures or refusing to do that audit reconciliation is another thing. In Canada, people were you know, I think on the provincial level they might have been using Dominion or electronic voting machines, but federally it's still pen and paper, show two pieces of ID. At the end of the day, you still have to trust the people who are actually counting the paper. Right. But it's a little bit tougher than... But if you have a system that is decentralized and you can audit the papers, it's... it's this is centralized, digital, being run by the man. Yes. Who this hates is Bolsonaro. Most, this is the most power, he's more powerful than the president. Of course he's more powerful than the president. Let me put it this way. People promised that Bolsonaro was going to be a dictator. He was Hitler. The press trashes him, defamates him every day until this day. No journalist got prosecuted. None. Zero. Uh, no, there's no political opposer that was prosecuted or, or persecuted in any way. Everyone kept saying bad things about Bolsonaro for four years, including crazy falsehoods, like he stabbed himself, like crazy stuff, okay? And nothing happened to them. To, the dictator didn't do anything to them. The dictator was a guy that defended free speech it's, it's, for everyone. The, the analogies with Trump is are, he's a fascist religion. dictator who gets deplatformed yes. from Twitter and Facebook. Yes. That's exactly what happened to him yes. back in the day. Well, the big tech were also, and, and I'm going to get to them because it's an there, important. There has part. to be a Twitter files Brazil, uh, uh, yes, version of, of Brazil. course, yeah. of course. Okay. Elon Musk is promising our batch of the Twitter files and haven't released them yet. But he fired everyone in Brazil. I mean. Elon Musk fired Elon. everyone in Brazil. Okay. Yeah, everyone. Like Twitter has basically no employees in Brazil anymore. He fired. It's, it is still operational. It is, and, okay. yeah. In Brazil, I mean, yeah, I don't know it's operational. partially, because uh, a lot of people are banned the platform by the by, court. By, Mor by Moraes, of course. Moraes, yes, by the court. But it's, okay. Anyways, they have this system, and Brazilians, everyone complained about it, and including the Social Democratic Party, said, "Well, in you, you're saying that Dilma from the Workers' Party won the presidential election in 26." 2014, but we can't verify, we can't audit, because it's all, it's all digital. You can't audit something that's in a system. And then uh, Brazil passed a law, actually, uh, passed several laws, uh, come up with the, coming up with a system that was pretty good, it would have the digital, it would, it would print a receipt, and the receipt would be in a box that you couldn't take it away, but it would have, after the elections you would have to match the count from the physical papers would have to match the electronic. So it's better. You would see. Still don't trust it. I, I, hand, ballot, hand hand signature or hand hand. But you, you have thing? well, Brazil requires ID. So you would go to the to, to the voting place, and you would have to show proof of ID. You would go to the machine, vote. You would see your vote being printed in a trans okay. translucent and box. And so someone who votes can say, that that's not my vote, it got flipped. as maybe. Exactly. So I, I can verify it myself. If there's a problem, you can report it the day of, Is, and exactly. it can be audited out. Exactly. Okay. It, it, it was a better system. Not perfect. There's no perfect system. But I thought it was pretty good, because you would have both. The conveniency and of the technolo technology, electronic, and you would have the paper trail. And it would be hard to fraud, harder, because you would have to match the count. Okay, it was a good system. Brazil passed that, Brazilian Congress passed that on a law, okay, on a bill. It was approved, president rect rectified, and then the 2016 election was supposed to happen with the system. But then one justice said, I'm going to suspend this law because um, I don't think, I'm, I'm going to grant an injunction for a, for a party because I think this violates the confidentiality of the vote. He didn't explain how. Uh, and they suspended for 2016 election, for 2018 election, I'm sorry. So that's Bolsonaro won with the electronic system. We don't know how by many votes he actually ended up winning, because who knows, but he ended up winning anyways. In 2020, before the 2020 election, the Supreme Court declared that the, the law was unconstitutional. 2022 election, you mean? 2020, because Brazil has like a midterm. Okay for municipal, uh, for city elections. So they declared the law was completely unconstitutional and they would have to amend the constitution to make paper vote a thing in Brazil. So Congress did that, okay, and they 
put a bill on the floor for amend the Constitution to get electronic vote system for the 2022 election. That was in 2021. So what happened was that some justices of the Supreme Court went to Congress and started lobbying against this bill. And by lobbying, according to a few congressmen, they were threatening, like mobsters, they were threatening congressmen with jail time if they voted for the bill. The bill ended up having a majority, but not the, uh, not the qualified majority that it, need, it needed to pass. So it was if he had more votes, I believe 2029 to 2021 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I remember the actual figures, but it had more votes, but it didn't pass. So, okay, the lobby, I'm, I'm talking about, think about, I don't know, uh, Sotomayor says going to Congress, U.S. Congress, and having meetings against a bill, okay? That actually happened. It's on the press. It's not, it's like, not a conspiracy theory. And I interviewed Congress members, I personally, that said I was threatened and I saw colleagues being threatened. So if they were or not, I don't know, but they, they claim, some of them claim they were. So with that, we had a system, all electronic. Alexander Moraes were, was going to oversee the election. And then you have all sorts of battles in courts, all crazy rules, all decisions against Bolsonaro making for him, very hard to run. Uh, and at the end, Lula got elected by one or two points. And, and what happens is that during, during this process, the Supreme Electoral Court also grant themselves special powers, like the power to deplatform people, including members of Congress, including journalists and all that. The station that I worked for, TV station that I worked for, um, again, my show was the number one in the country. What, what was the station? If you're it, it's Chauvin Pan. Okay. Uh, they were censored. We couldn't say certain things on air. Uh, for example, we couldn't call Lula next con. We could not. They said it was illegal to do so. And several other words. There were like a few words that we couldn't say on air, on TV. Uh, and um, again, businessmen were arrested. Um, at one point, Bolsonaro's party filed a lawsuit against Lula's party saying that they had millions of radio spots, more than they were supposed to. Because in Brazil, it's the radio spots and TV it's spots. Supposed to be equal, equal, equal airplay. Because everything is paid by taxpayer money, so airplay should be equal. And they found out that Bolsonaro's party had millions less spots than Lula's party. And when they filed a lawsuit, then Moraes was the, just, the judge. Is this the Moraes who then uh, sanctioned um, the Bolsonaro same. like millions of dollars for abusive proceedings or something along yes, those lines? Yes, that was the case. Okay. And that was the case. He, he, he dismissed 20, and sanctioned. The, uh, it, if it wasn't the lawyers, it was Bolsonaro. It was Bolsonaro's party for twenty-two million reais, which is, I don't know, roughly five million dollars, okay. uh, uh, for abuse of procedures, for proceedings, yeah, for procedures, uh, uh, abuse of proceeding. I mean, uh, yeah, okay, a variation of that, but yeah, uh, uh, exactly. Uh, and and again, and they dismissed the case. Then election was over. Uh, the military came up with a report saying because they were overseeing the process by Bolsonaro. They were invited by the Supreme Court, by the Supreme Superior Electoral Court to oversee the process. Bolsonaro was pushing towards that because he trusted the military. So the military came up with a report saying, look, we couldn't do our job. The, 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 the software of this electronic electronic system has 17 million lines and they only let us audit with a pen and a p pencil. <laughs> they okay. didn't let us really audit and we found but he, we found several vulnerabilities and we cannot attest the system is safe. So I'm, I'm talking about the military, the Department of Defense, okay, in Brazil. So we suggest with urgency 
that we investigate, we, we open up an investigation to verify if the system is safe or not. And the court's going to say, well, this is this is Bolsonaro's military making recommendations that are favorable to Bolsonaro, so to be disregarded. And no. You know what they said? Oh, we're glad you didn't find any evidence of fraud. Thank you for your report. And then they issued a letter, a public letter. I'm talking about the Joint Chief issued a letter and, and the Minister of Defense issued a letter saying, we did not say we did not find evidence. That was not the scope of our work. We're saying that we cannot attest that the system, the system is safe and secure. And this is a vulnerability and we need to address that urgently. And they're like, eh, I'm going to ignore it. And then a lot of things happened. A guy from Argentina started releasing documents uh, showing that depending on the model of the machine, will it get got a way higher vote uh, than Bolsonaro, depending on the model, on the year. So the machines that were audited, Bolsonaro, on the machines that, that were audited, Bolsonaro won. On the machines that were not audited, older machines, Lula won. So, and it was it was a I mean it was a fra it was less than a percent or give or take a percentage difference. What did Bolsonaro win with back in twenty eighteen? Uh, I don't I don't remember. Uh, it, it, it was a it was a big amount. Though, yeah, right? like over five percent. Okay. See, I think ten percent maybe. So the, and this time around after the after because the, he, he, he uh, we have two rounds right. You have a run up and uh, yeah. and 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 he he won the second round, Bolsonaro. And again, on the second round now, Lula won by a percent. Uh, yeah, less than 2%. Um, now, the last time that I, I heard you talk publicly about this, the question was whether or not Bolsonaro is going to declare martial law or bring in the military. Um, what, what's happened since the election? Bolsonaro went to the States or came to the States. I don't know if he's still here now. He's still he's still in exile from so Brazil. So after the election, he tried to challenge the election, showing um, some electoral inconsistencies. And again, again, he was, for a second time, his party was, uh, he was uh, fined for abuse of proceedings. By the, by the, the same judge. Okay. Uh, he, he dismissed the case and all that. Um, and, and, at one point, after all the, that happened, a lot of people started looking for the Brazilian Constitution. We have an article in the, the Brazilian Constitution, it's Article 142, that says what, what is the role of the military in Brazil. And um, uh, they say that the role, among the roles, is to guarantee law and order and uh, to guarantee constitutional powers. And there's a discussion of what what is the meaning of that. So if a judge, if there's a conflict between powers and there's a power that's doing stuff that's out of the constitution, is that still a constitutional power? So if you if you have to if your role is to guarantee constitutional powers, um, don't you have to do something if a power is overstepping? and the other power can't react. That was a discussion. Uh, law, a guarantee law and order as well. It's like, how is that under the law? This is uh, completely outside of the rule of law. We're having journalists being, uh, we have, well, in the meantime, a lot of things happened. Congressmen uh, were arrested. They suspended uh, uh, parliamentary immunity, um, congressional immunity. Yeah. Uh, they uh, suspended, uh, in a certain sense, in Brazil, they even suspended the right of assembly, the of people to assembly and protest. A lot of things started happening, and, and things got got hard. On December 30th, I was here in the U.S. with my family, and then uh, I got a call from a source in a big tech company saying, I just received a court order by the Morais, and all your 4 million followers on social media, like, uh, he, 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 he's uh, mandating to block you from all social media. I was like, wow, that's interesting. On December 30th. And in the meantime, people were like thinking if, the, if something was going to happen in Brazil. And because of my history with the military, I had a lot of sources in the military. I know it was reporting of what people were talking about uh, regarding this issue. And he decided to uh, suspend all my social media not suspend, pretty much 
block block by way of court order. Yeah, in Brazil only. Yeah. So if you're in the U.S., you can still access, except that Rumble and locals and through social, they said they're not going to com comply with any orders because they're not even in Brazil, so they're not even getting these orders. So apparently, um, but other than that, all other, like Twitter, Facebook, uh, I don't know, Telegram, all that. Block you in, in, in Brazil. Brazil. So if you're in Brazil, you can't see me. Unless, unless you have a VPN, I presume. Unless you have a VPN or in Rumble and Locals. Okay. Uh, What's your Locals before we forget and I'll put it in afterwards? It's Rio P. Figueiredo. Rio P. P. Figueiredo. Yes. Uh, I like it's spelled on the like it's spelled on the thumbnail, people. The Rio so, P. Figueiredo. Okay. Yes. Uh, but and then I found out later. Again, I never got. Remember, all this is sealed. So I never got the court order, but I, again, I'm a journalist, so a source from the federal police that happened to like me said, look, I'm, 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 I'm seeing the court order against you right here. Uh, it's not only your social media. Uh, he also ordered to freeze all your assets in Brazil and bank accounts, all of them, 100%. Do you have any? I do, yeah, of course. Um, and they have been frozen? Yes, it's all frozen. All of it, everything, including my companies. In Brazil, completely frozen. Bank accounts, personal bank account. So my father I used to send him money. I can. It's like all of it frozen. Uh, he also, uh, I don't know the name of that, but in Brazil, you have a right of a, it's like Trump. His tax uh, returns are like, not secret, but private. You Confident, well, Confidential. Confidentiality. Yeah, yeah. He broke all confidentiality of all my tax returns and bank records and all the credit card records and all that. Uh, he also uh, apparently uh, issued a fine for every time I speak anything un undemocratic or anything that make people doubt Brazilian electoral system. Uh, 20,000 hash fines, like a $4,000 fine for every day that I uh, say anything derogatory of Brazilian institutions like I'm doing now. Uh, and also, um, he did something very weird. He canceled my passport. And I'm, I called several lawyers in Brazil. They're like, I never heard of anything like that. It's like, they don't cancel passport for international drug dealers. So like, yeah, I guess I'm trafficking something worse than cocaine, which is information, right? And not just information. Accurate information. That's yes. that's that's more important. But according to them, disinformation. Yes, and and that was the actual term they used. Disinformation. This is all on the. There's no conviction. This is all. No, there's there's no accusation. It's not there's there's no conviction. There's no accusation. All this is under a probe that's sealed. No lawyers got access. Look, I have as a businessman, I've dealt with all the big lawyers in Brazil. They're all friends of mine, so I call them and say, look. And some of them, very leftist lawyers. And I called them and said, look, what, what's going on? What can I do? And they said, Paulo, there's, there's nothing you can do. There's no, there's no appeal. This is the highest instance, and it's all sealed. So you just have to wait. That's it. Uh, Bolsonaro never called in the military. He he left and has, I don't know. Did he formally concede? Does he have to? No, he didn't concede. He didn't have to. Um, he he made a brief speech saying that he was going to follow the constitution. Uh, he left Brazil on December thirtieth, the same day that the Demorais did that to me, mm -hmm. and he came to the U.S. Um, he never used the military. He never uh, declared martial law or anything like that. Uh, I understand, and, and, and they fault they faulted him for not giving a, a proper transition of power to. Um, to no, Lula. he actually he actually started the transition of power right after the election, uh, but he never he never did the ceremony. In Brazil, you have like a like a thing that you put on body and you just give it to. Well, the, when when Trump not to draw more analogies, when Trump yeah. said he wasn't going to the inauguration, yeah, the Twitter, thing. Twitter heard that as a call to violence. Yeah, something along those lines. It was yeah. a, a dog whistle. Yeah, same thing uh, with Bolsonaro. He came to the U.S. He's been living here, uh, but he's gonna have. Well, and then January eighth happened in yeah, Brazil, which is the 
Ja Brazil's January 6th. Oh, it's so similar that you wouldn't believe. Except that Brazilians are more violent than Americans. So, I mean, when Americans entered Congress. Well, and they, they took selfies and one guy took a picture holding a lectern. And, but there, there was some violence. You can't, can't, can't discount that. But it, it was the most unarmed insurrection you've ever seen. And it was not an insurrection. Look, to be an insurrection, you have to have the expectancy to, to seize power. And we didn't have that. It was a Sunday. No one was there. No one ever thought, oh, okay, I'm going to enter the palace and now I'm going to proclaim myself the president or whatever, or the king or emperor. So it's just people were, you, have, you had everything. You had uh, agents, provocateurs, mm -hmm. same as in the U.S. Um, you have, and right now we know that for a fact, that we had Lula's government, uh, so again, same as in the U.S., uh, reducing the amount of uh, police officers, yeah. police forces over there. You had the honeypot, all that. Same thing. And you had a lot of people that weren't happy with the fact that their voices were not being heard. Before that, people spent, I don't know, two months protesting in front of military bases, asking for military intervention. Thousands of people throughout the country and their voices were not being heard by anyone, including Bolsonaro. Because Bolsonaro disappointed a lot of people. I, look, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the rule of law. So I didn't want Bolsonaro to become a dictator in Brazil. I didn't want him to stay not even one day more than, uh, than his term. By the end of his term, he had to leave. But Lula didn't win the election fair and square. So he can't be the president. So you need to come up with a solution for that. The U.S. Constitution, and you and Barnes discusses that a lot in 2020, lack remedies for that. But Brazilian Constitution does have a remedy, like it or not, which is the Article 142. And yes, it's, it's, it's something that, that has never been done, but it's written. It's in the law. And so Bolsonaro didn't do it. He didn't did, do it. He claims he didn't have support yeah, and from the military. Military says otherwise. It's partially true and partially not true. Because he had some support of some military leaders, but he didn't have for, from others. So at the end, he, was, it, 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 he didn't feel like he had a way of doing it. I think he did if you ask me, and, and Lula's in power. And I have to say, after that 40% of Brazilians, just like in the U.S., think Lula did not win the election fair and square. So that makes, how, how can you have democracy when 40% of the, it's not that 40% of the people didn't vote for him. It's 40% of the people think we didn't have an election. And the courts, don't even address that. You know, and, and, and they sanction the party who goes exactly. through. It, it was, it's, the similarities between this and, and the states are, are shocking. It just seems like a playbook for governments seizing control and uh, facilitating a situation where they can never be forced to relinquish it. Um, so, I mean, so, so when it, Bolsonaro did not invoke martial law or that article. Uh, pissed a lot of people off, disappointed a lot of people. Now they're left with this fait accompli. Lula is president. A lot of people don't believe in the sanctity of elections anymore. Well, we have, we have, we have uh, roughly 1,000 people uh, arrested without due process after our January 8th, yeah. or January 6th. People are still in jail, um, most of them without access to lawyers. Uh, the January 6th defendants, most yes. of them facing ambiguous charges, if any charges. Uh, With the difference that I've seen centralized on the Supreme Court. In the U.S., you had several courts and several federal judges dealing with the... And, I mean, and with the difference that in as much as there's no official media gag order in the States, you might have a, a, a leftist-dominated media. There's alternative media that talks about it in Brazil. Oh, in Brazil, the station that I worked for, he received a, a complaint from the Department of Justice that they were spreading misinformation. And because of that, they fired all and, and with uh, threatening to cancel their public concession of the airwaves yeah. 
And because of that, they fired all conservative commentators, including myself. And they were literally crying when they fired me because I had the highest ratings in the country. And they were like, we love you. We love working with you. Same with uh, my colleague, Rodrigo Constantino, and I, who, out, by the way, also had his passport canceled and all that. Same thing that happened to me happened to him and other people. And, and, and Rodrigo was also, was also a guy that brought great ratings. Um, and, and they loved working with us, but they said, we have to fire you in order to stay, stay, stay open. And, and not stay face open. criminal charges, I presume. Exactly. And, and since then, they fell from the second or first largest TV news stations to the fifth or, or sixth because of public. The audience hated it. Uh, the viewers hated it. And and could they? I mean, I'll ask this. And they question. hired. They hired only uh, like social democrats guys. Well, c could they even announce the reason for which they fired you in Brazil or no? no? They can't say that. Okay. But everybody knows it. I know. It's it's it's, it's but, like uh, one day I, you have one guy that's like doing two shows a day, like five hours of a year, and people are like viewerships like on, it's like skyrocket, and now they have to fire the guy. It's like for what? And it, it it was not me. They fired like a bunch of people. Mo all their conservative commentators, and I don't, I don't consider myself a conservative, uh, but anyways, I, I, I'm, I, I'm anti you don't socialist. You don't consider yourself conservative, but they do, yeah, and, they do. And, and a far right, alt right conservative at that. Exactly. Um, so now, bottom line, at the, and we, I know we've got you've got somewhere to go. I don't know what time. It's two hours since we started at about three fifteen. What time is it? It's it's three eleven. It's three eleven now. So we're good. Um, your bottom line is it's not a irrational fear it's not a it's not hyperbole it's not exaggeration you can't go back to your homeland if you still I don't have a passport so supposedly I can't go anywhere uh, but also my source says there's an order in the federal police system that if I let's say I have a different passport and I'm not gonna say if I do it or if I don't or, or if I don't because why tell them, right? I would not have asked, and I won't ask. But, uh, yes. but let's say, let's say hypothetically, you, you, land, you land in Brazil. I land in Brazil. You're getting arrested. I'm uh, not getting arrested, but I can't leave the country. I might get arrested, but I can't leave the country, even with a different passport. Okay. And and there's no again. It's not that I not I haven't been convicted. There are no charges against me. So they need to follow the procedures to notify me of the investigation that's ongoing. I can't find out my sources in the federal police. The guy might be lying. I don't know. He's not. Uh, but, but he needs to notify me. He, he needs to do that by a, through a rogatory letter uh, and follow procedures. The, the, way he, the reason he, they don't, it's very simple because there's there's no process there's no there's there are no there are no documents seal is bullshit for things that don't exist well forget or or, or they'll make the, they'll make them exist they'll fabricate something i think one of the other reasons why they won't do that is you'll go public with it and then people might see the so not only that the doj in the united states needs to receive look if there's probable cause look if it follows the the treaty between Brazil and the United States. It falls under, it's like, I'm protected by the First Amendment. I know the U.S. looks bad now, but it's still, you can say, you can, it, except it, for the big tech. Oh, by the way, quick chapter about the big tech. When, when um, everything happened in Brazil, big tech, including Facebook, YouTube, they updated their policy, uh, making it... Uh, uh, not illegal, but making a violation of their terms of service to say anything bad about the Brazilian elections as well. It's, no, it's the that, same thing. No, that, I'm just, no, I mean, Zuckerberg now, you know, he recognizes the FBI misled him about the Hunter li laptop. You know, here's the warning. Don't, you know, you might want to be on the lookout for this. And so what do they do after having interfered in the 2020 elections? They go and act policies. This is post, this is post election, but, you know, in a way it's challenging the election. Outlaw it. And get Zook and I don't know who else, uh, Twitter, on the social media, to prevent people's ability to, to challenge, lawfully question. I, I don't know how there could be an unlawful manner to question the elections, but 
they, right back to election interference at the behest of a government that arguably got it to power uh, through illegitimate means. Now you can't investigate it, or you can't even talk about it. Can't talk about it. And, and, and from my perspective is, look, you're a public servant. Demorais, you're the most powerful man in the country. You're a public servant. I'm a journalist. It's my job to ask questions. Like you or not, if you don't like the questions I'm asking, it's just quit, resign. I'm going to keep asking them. And, and you can try to shut me down, but I, I keep saying that. You have to shoot me in the back of the head because that's the ideology. That's your ideology. You're just not there yet, but that's what you want to do. Shutting me down as a journalist and shooting me it's the same mentality. I, I, I've been, you know, for, I, I hate making the even, you know, making those words come together in a sentence by putting that juju out in the universe. But I get the, the idea. Killing is 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 assassinating is almost messier than just digitally assassinating, financially assassinating, starving to death, and then hope hope that the person does something terrible to themselves. It's it's much cleaner. It's much easier. It is. Um, I don't and I don't want to ask and pry into what's you know what has been seized and frozen in Brazil, but psychologically i can imagine a lot well uh, and 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 the the, the the i was a businessman then well that, and, uh, you know money's one thing freedom is another and I'm, is. I'm looking at you and i might be projecting but i might be you know feeling the same thing as you're looking at brazil and saying what the hell has happened to my home country i have now been i've been i i would be a prisoner in my own country and they've turned my country my homeland into a prison the same way i'm sort of looking at justin trudeau up north uh, how do you how do you internalize all of this um... my father's 79 years old let's say he gets sick in brazil he's not here he's in brazil let's say he gets sick what do i do you, you'll you'll ask morais de Moraes for a compassion of uh, uh visa and and an assurance that they won't arrest you or lock you down i'm, I'm being cynical but like in canada you know, that's they they did they issued com, uh, compassion visas so there's no compassion come. this guy's a psychopath and i don't mean that i'm not calling names I mean technically speaking the is a psychopath he's not capable of compassion technically speaking yeah so there's no and can your can your family leave if they wanted to or yeah for now I, I believe we're not in North Korea yet but it's the same mentality it's the same ideology and uh I get, of course. You interview Glenn Greenwald, Glenn Greenwald, and Glenn, well, he's, I think you put it well in the show where the, the lines between left and right are, are blurred in a sense, in the traditional sense. Uh, but Glenn and I have different perspectives of, about a lot of things, but he's a damn good journalist, very honest guy, <laughs> and I respect him a lot. He, this is the guy who exposed NSA and CIA. And before he started talking about this that's going on in Brazil, he said he has never been a, so afraid in his life about publishing a story. Mm -hmm. So meaning the guy who exposed the NSA and the CIA thinks Demorais is more dangerous than these guys. That says a lot to me. And it's not that I'm not afraid of Demorais. Of course I am. He can do, still do a lot of stuff to me as he has been. But silence is not an option, right? What, what, what did I do? Um, and again, I'll, I'll quote Jordan Peterson again. Hold on one second. Are we still... Yeah, it's just a little battery here. Because uh, we, 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 sometimes I think when we go over two hours, yeah. it might... Okay, good. We're still live. Um, I'll quote Jordan Peterson again. He says, if you have something to say, silence is a lie. And I have a lot to say about what's going on. If you have something to say, silence is a lie. Yeah. This is Jordan Peterson. Fantastic. The guy's a genius. I... I, I, I even if I disagree with Jordan Peterson on, you know, regime change in Iran, we live in a world now where the second someone who you considered an ally says something you disagree with, they have to become like, you know, people I like can say things I don't like. Oh, people yeah. I respect can say things I don't respect. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a limit after yeah. which, you know. 
If I've been I've been disagreeing a lot with Jordan Peterson ab about Russia a lot recently, uh, but the guy's a genius. He's a, he's, a, he's a genius, and I was listening to him talk about the Bible. It makes me want. I, I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to start reading the Bible. Oh and, no, you got it. This well, Genesis was unbelievable. Yeah, well, it, but it was, Exodus it, now is even better. Uh, so, I mean, and he, and, he, and it says he says something that is exactly the way I feel. It's like, it's not that I don't fear the Moraes, it's that I fear God more. It's like, if I don't do the right thing, you know? It's, it's exactly that, exactly that. That if I, if I, if I shut up now and stop saying this, the things that I'm saying. Well, first of all, yeah, you, you, it, it will not get you in anybody's good graces for the people. I, it might, they, they might, if, when you comply, they show their mercy when you bend to the system, they show a little bit of their mercy. Is it, is it Michael Malice who said, they want you dead, but they'll accept your compliance exactly. or something, something along those lines? Yeah. yeah. That's, if, if, and that's what the, every lawyer that I talked to said, just shut up for a while, disappear for a year, don't say anything, and then we'll try to talk him out of it. It's not that like we're going to fight in court. We're going to talk him out of it. It's like, what? No way. I'd rather, I'd rather die, literally, literally, and I mean it. No way, no way. Now let's end on a, a high, uh, not I say a happier note. Uh, I, I'm, I'm being sarcastic because you'll see what the question I'm going to ask. One rumor, one thing. My brother, who's in Canada now, gotten very involved in, in activism as relates to vaccine mandates, vaccine injury. He says to me, Dave or Viva, I forget what he says. He says, uh, uh, in Brazil, they're uh, compelling vaccination against the will on prisoners. Yes. Uh, a recent video went around of Lula. Be careful what you wish for, Brazil. You've gotten it now. Saying, uh, predicating the the what was it? It was Bols, uh, Bolsa Familia. Yeah. Bolsa Familia predicating social welfare on mothers vaccinating their children. Um, there was one. There was one translation which said, "If you don't vaccinate your children, you're going to lose them." And I think one translated that as them as being children, but it means your benefits. They're not taking away kids yet. Are, no, these, not, rumor, are these rumors true? And are uh, and yeah. to what extent? You're not going to lose your kids, but you're going to lose all your benefits. You're mandating for all prisoners, and that happens at the same time as Project Veritas uncovered everything regarding Pfizer. We all saw that video. Uh, it's not a good week to mention Project Veritas, but <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be talking about yeah, tonight I, with Barnes people. I saw your, I saw your your, your comments about it. This is why I'm joking about it. Uh, but they did an amazing work uh, there, uh, and also this week the Department of um, the, the the Florida Surgeon General issued an alert about the the. That side effects have, that you have when you're going to give something when you're going to recommend to doctors you have to let them know the they risks might, they might have a heart attack yes it's, it's, they it's might die and develop like other stuff thrombosis and, and other stuff you have to, to let people know and in brazil it's mandatory so it's it's a disgrace and and it's not only that the government of sao paulo which is the guy who won the government of, of sao paulo is a big bolsonaro guy he's supposed to be a bolsonaro successor He's expanding the vaccination of babies in a partnership with Pfizer. It's like, what? Really? In what planet are you living? Is that really a thing? So the bottom line of everything that we talked about is that Brazil is the Disneyland of globalism and the modern leftism. So every idea that's present in the U.S. is in Brazil with steroids. And because I, we don't have to use the vaccination metaphor, our society doesn't have the immune system to fight it. Our institutions are not strong enough. So everything that you heard here, everything that I talked about is present in the United States in some form. The juristocracy, just hope the, the, you, you hope is, the immune system of America is strong enough to withstand It has this been virus. so far. Touch wood? But we don't know. That's not wood. This is metal. But. <laughs> or touch gold. My, my um, daycare teacher was, was a, is an Indian woman. She says touch wood was from touching the original Holy Cross, which is what the expression came from. Okay. So uh, she, they say touch gold, which is the, the good luck non-religious way. I, guess. I don't have any gold on me. Platinum. Honey. That's not even gold. Um, yeah, no, you just hope. Like, like Canada, 
didn't have didn't have the robust protective measures the U.S. has, uh, and I don't think it's able to withstand it. The only question is, can they feed off another country's resistance and see that it doesn't go good places when it goes to these places, and you don't come back from these places, as you're describing now in Brazil. It's very hard. Now. Uh, the the only hope I have in Brazil right now doesn't come from elections. It comes from the tensions within the left, from within the, what the workers' parties want. It's not exactly the same thing that this more globalist, social democratic left wants. I mean, these guys, the globalists, don't want Brazil to turn into another Venezuela. The worker party, workers' parties do. So, thus, so it's it's a. Uh, they might clash. Their interests might clash. And from that clash, something might happen. Because the majority of Brazilian society, the majority now, and, I, and, I, I'm, a, and I, I'm, I'm positive, the majority of Brazilian society don't want that. None of that. Venezuela or globalism. The majority of Brazilian society don't want that. We just need to, we need two things right now. Very important things. We need Brazilian people, the average Joe, the rav average Homer Simpson guy, to realize we're not a democracy anymore. We need to realize that. We are not a democracy anymore in any sense. To put it in a James Madison perspective, we're, we, don't, we don't protect the will of the majority anymore because we don't have fair elections, and we don't protect the rights of the minority. So we're not a democracy. I mean, technically, again. And we need the international community to realize that as well. Yeah. Which which international community? The the the, the one on which uh, Lula appears uh, with his with his landing page on the WEF website. Yes, but also yes, that's true. The, the UN, which is in bed with. Uh, true. We're never going to get these guys, but. Republicans are pretty strong in the United States, and Brazilians look up for America to America a lot. And 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 if you had the Republican Party more concerned with what's going on in Brazil, it would be very very helpful, very helpful. And I've talked to several congressmen here in the U.S., and they don't seem to care a lot, unfortunately. I, I, I my white pill last faith is. It's the the populism that we've seen nationally has to has to become international, where you know everyone everywhere is going to say we either uh, stand up to this now and oppose these measures. And I think once they start, you know, once they start compelling vaccination on children and certain certain things become undeniable, that's when you're going to have people start saying enough is enough. Some might say I, I can't even admit that because it would admit that I've done harm to to my loved ones. But that's like in Brazil right now, workers party, union workers, whatever, when people are told what they have to put in their body with a sharp little metal needle, then they might start realizing, well, what have what the hell have we just ushered in here? Because I know that now my life and my my benefits are predicated on this and I feel like I'm being physically violated, which I am. So maybe at that point it, it becomes an actual populist, not uprising, but a populist resistance, a populist movement. Well, a lot of people, when I tell my story, they're like, Brazilian people, they look at me and it's like, what? They did that to you? Can they do that? It's like, what's going on? They don't know what's going on. So it's part of my job to tell to the Brazilian audience and to your audience, international audience, uh, what's going on in Brazil. And everything that I said here, I swear, everything is accurate. The in, if it's not, the internet will figure it out. They'll take the clip and they'll say this yes. is where Paolo got yes. it wrong. And, and I remember, uh, well, on Patrick Bet David, they, apparently they couldn't find someone on the left, on the other side to come and engage at the same time. I, I, I wouldn't qualify you as being on the right, but if anybody wants to come in and say, my goodness, what he said I, is all wise, come and do it. I'd any, love any to. Any day of the week. Any day. I'm, this, 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 I, I became more known in Brazil for debating other commentators. So... I, it's my, it's my number one thing. I love doing it. Paulo, I'm going to ask: uh, Is there anything that I forgot to ask you that you absolutely want to say? I think the answer has to be no. Is there anything I forgot to get to that you absolutely said, Viva? I wanted to say that when I came on. 
I don't know. I don't remember. We talked for over <laughs> yes, two hours. It was, it's been great. But again, it's it, it's so rich. What, what, from a journalist perspective, not a, not from a personal perspective, but from a journalist perspective, this this has been interesting. Interesting times. I'm witnessing a lot of interesting stuff in Brazil. And it, it's, it's good to know all that. So it's, not, it's, not, it's not boring. Right? We're, we're in the proverbial desert, Paulo. Um, everybody, where can, where can people find you? And I'll put the links in the description in any event. But where can people find you? They can find me on Rumble and Locals mainly. And uh, yes, outside of the Real United States. P. Figueredo. Yes. And the spelling the way it's in the thing there, in, in, the, in the thumbnail, in the title. Uh, and you're on Twitter? I'm on Twitter uh, for outside of Brazil. Yeah. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> or in Brazil with VPNs. Uh, uh, is, or, is it illegalized yet in Brazil? To no, you know, you know, there was a thing um, circulating on the internet. I don't know how accurate that is, uh, but saying that Brazil was the number one country in a few things. We can, we can check that. Rumble growth, uh, number of downloads of the Signal app, and new VPN accounts in the month of January. Right, with the is that, is that, does, does that sound like a like a healthy democracy to you? It sounds like uh, <laughs> the. Dystopian, I think number one was China. It's, but it sounds it sounds like the dystopian novels that we that we read as children. I mean, my, my daughter just read a book of about a, about a future in which they charge you for air and in which every you know the, the unhealthy people. Uh, don't get the same amount of. I forget what the book was called. Any, anybody who knows the book, it's a good. It sounded totally far fetched, and yet we're not. We're not far off. We're, you want to surprise me, Paulo? Uh, thank you very much. Hold on. Thank you for and, having me. Thank you. And every time I say I'm going to bring a mug to give, I have a mug with the with the with the Viva Fro on it. I forget, but we'll, we'll meet again, and I'll I'll give you. I, I need. You're going to do jujitsu with me, right? Uh, I'm so I'm going to do this now. I don't want to say the name because I don't want too many people calling. And I, I can't take classes in classes. If I do courses, it has to be one-on-one -on -one because I'm too embarrassed. So, like, oh, taking no, no. classes of fighting, it's like dancing in public, which I, I do not do. You know, these guys at Valencia Brothers are, are actually... It, he, the guy just called me a couple of times. It's his birthday, Pedro Valencia's birthday today. I, I, I'm doing it. It's not a question. I'm going to be like... No, the most they're unbelievable. Okay. You're going to love their classes and the private lessons as well. I'm doing it. Let's do There's it. There's that. And what else? Eat Brazilian steak. I have to. I have. I have not done that. Um, I have not done that in Florida. And there's, there's. I, I noticed a lot of great Brazilian restaurants near. near you, you live uh, near the best butcher shop in probably Florida, in Boca. You're gonna give me that name afterwards. Yeah, easy well. meats. Easy meats. Easy meats. Yes. Okay. Their wagyu picanha, is, I swear to you, it's the best steak you'll ever had. Wagyu picanha. Done. And done, and I might do it on the way home tonight. <laughs> Paulo, thank you very much. This was, everybody, um, see you tonight for Biba and Barnes Law for the People. Sunday night stream on a Tuesday, but Paul, uh, check Paulo out. Thank you very much. Send my best to Robert. Absolutely, will do. Thank you. Peace out, peeps.